So welcome uh, to another uh, ISI webinar virtual conference. This is what used to be uh, planned to be our Seattle conference that we are doing in tandem with the Discovery Institute. I'm my, my name is Thomas Pack. I work for the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. I'm on right now with John West of the Discovery Institute. Um, thrilled to be on here. Uh, this is looking to be looking like it's going to be our best attended conference yet, and we're. Yeah, we're thrilled to see the you know an increase in interest in our conferences. That's really um, heartening. Uh, this one's particularly uh, exciting. It's a great topic. So I've been looking through people's presentations and videos, and, and you know we've got great speakers and we've got some awesome content. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, we're here today to talk about this the topic of science, scientism, and society. Uh, I'm sure you'll get a better definition of scientism later on from somebody better than me. But when I think of scientism, I think of Francis Bacon. I think of replacing God with science. Um, you know, I, ISI wanted to do this conference because we think it's an interesting topic that, in, that deserves more investigation. Uh, my personal take is seems bad to replace God with science. It also seems bad to replace science with God. So I think that we have a really interesting question here of how to sort of toggle in the middle ground. Uh, so it should be really unique discussion. And I'm going to, you know, when my, you know, when I'm examining the talks, I'm going to be thinking about being fair both to science and to God. Uh, hopefully, you won't hear any questions from me because you'll have much better questions uh, as an audience, and I'll have to ask those. But um, I'd encourage you to use that same philosophy yourselves. Um, Okay, so that's my sort of spiel. Dr. West, um, you know, we introduce people here with memes. So, you know, I apologize. In, oops. So I apologize in advance. Um, I, you know, I, it's not my fault that I'm like this, really. Um, but this was the, the best <laughs> about the, you know, the best C.S. Lewis. Um, Lion, the Witch, and the Wu-Tang Clan. Uh, just the art meshes so perfectly. Uh, but if anyone else knows has a better C.S. Lewis themed meme, please drop it in the chat. I'm very curious. Um, before I go forward with your introduction, I'm going to remind people the rules are very clear. Be very civil to each other. We never have a problem with that, but be civil in the chat. And if you have questions, I'm going to come in and ask all of our speakers questions, you know, Q&A questions. Please drop them in the Q&A tab. So you can use the chat tab to talk to one another, uh, but please use the Q&A tab for any questions you want me to ask the speakers. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to tell you about uh, Dr. John West. He's the author and editor of a dozen books, including, and most importantly, the ISI published Darwin Day in America, How Politics and Culture Have Been Dehumanized in the Name of Science. Um, I'll put a link to that book uh, in the chat if you guys are interested. Uh, he's also published uh, several other books, including books on C.S. Lewis and Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth, uh, you know, Walt Disney, and Scientism. Um, you know, he's also written and directed multiple documentaries, including Human Zoos, Revolutionary, The Biology of the Second Reich, and Privileged Species. Uh, he's been interviewed by Time, Newsweek, USA Today, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and has appeared on CNN, Fox News, and C-SPAN. The former chair of the Department of Political Science at Seattle Pacific University, West holds a PhD in government from Claremont Graduate University. Uh, so welcome to John West. Um, I'm going to spare you from this meme and put up this video. Um, Dr. West, I'm going to remind you to mute your mic when the video plays. Um, I'm going to disappear, and I will be back um, in 25 minutes to do your Q&A with you. So, Great. Okay, let's get started. We will restore science to its rightful place and wield technology's wonders.
C.S. Lewis thought that science was a good thing, but he also thought that it held some really strong dangers. The biggest danger really was the penchant to control. Uh, in a scientific view, if you think that is the only way that we have knowledge of the world, and so uh, if you think that if I have the scientific truth about something, that's you know, the end of story, I know everything, that really tends to feed a power trip. Whether you're a scientist or you're a politician who's trying to latch on to the prestige of science, uh, you really have people who are going to abuse their power because they think, look, we're the only ones who know what should happen because we know how the universe really works. Therefore, we should be able to dictate uh, what our cultural beliefs are. We should dictate what uh, our government should do, how we should design governmental programs. We should dictate uh, all manner of public policy and that anyone who doesn't have a scientific training or isn't part of the consensus view of science is basically stupid or against progress or against science and so should be really swept by the wayside and shouldn't be listened to. And I think Lewis thought that that almost totalitarian impulse was really a dangerous thing. Lewis I think was properly so frightened by that uh, potential within science and that's why he stressed why we really need a way to understand the limits of science and that uh, there is something behind science, a larger transcendent ethical sphere behind science uh, and that we aren't just blind matter in motion, that we're part of a designed universe that actually sets limits on what we should and shouldn't do. It's an age-old problem. How do we prevent something good from being twisted for evil ends? C.S. Lewis hoped that scientists themselves would find a way to rescue science from scientism, creating a regenerate science that respected human rights and honored human dignity, a science that would no longer be the magician's twin. Okay, I chose that clip because it uh, is from a documentary I did based on a book called The Magician's Twin, which I edited a few years ago. And I think it gets us into some of the topics that we are going to be discussing today. Let me open up a, my slide deck and then we will get started. So over the past few weeks, we have been hearing a common refrain from public officials, uh, which is, we need to make decisions based on science. Science, not politics, must be the guide. We've got to pay attention to science. Those are all actual quotes from politicians over the past few weeks. These comments, of course, are being made in reference to fighting COVID-19, but I think they're indicative of a much more widespread sentiment that has been growing uh, for the past few years. Since 2017, more than a million people have joined uh, this annual March for Science protests in hundreds of cities around the globe. These protesters' self-professed mission is, quote, to mobilize advocates around the world in support of evidence-based, science-informed public policies, unquote. Some of the protesters have proclaimed an almost messianic vision of scientists in societies, uh, exemplified by their slogan, which we get to, Scientists pursuing truth, saving the world. I think the COVID-19 crisis has taken the messianic vision of science to an entirely new level. Consider the hero of the day, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, people are now wearing masks with the slogan, trust Fauci. And last week, a, a Harvard scientist actually put up this post on Twitter, in Dr. Fauci, we trust. Of course, mimicking our national motto, in God we trust. Now, I do wanna say this messianic vision of science is somewhat understandable, and I think we can appreciate the power of it. Anyone who has taken an aspirin or uses an iPhone appreciates the benefits of modern science. I certainly do. Science has produced wonder-working drugs and miraculous inter inventions. It's led to staggering increases in both personal freedom and wealth. Uh, my dad remained alive and healthy past his 100th birthday 
because of advances in medical science that cured him of colon cancer twice. We enjoy fresh fruits and vegetables year round because of technological innovations in transportation and refrigeration. Uh, people of all classes now have instantaneous access to vast online libraries that would make the fabled library of Alexandria seem provincial. And of course, you're able to watch me right now because of revolutionary scientific advances in mass communications. Given these almost magical powers that science has demonstrated, I think the seductive appeal of what C.S. Lewis called sometimes scientocracy, rule of society by scientists, is undeniable. Why not trust scientists to lead us? Why not replace or at least modify representative democracy with a society where decisions about public policy and culture are made by neutral experts exercising their scientific expertise. I think many Americans might well agree this would be a good idea. According to a Pew Forum survey last year, 2019, the number of people who have a great deal of confidence in scientists to act in the best interests of the public rose an astonishing 67% from 2016 to 2019. Americans currently trust their scientists more than they do their religious leaders, uh, military leaders, the news media, business leaders, and even public school principals. Yet, as important as scientific expertise is to solving problems, I think handing over authority to unelected scientific experts would be deeply problematic. And I think C.S. Lewis gives us some guidance here. In 1958, Lewis wrote an essay on the dangers of Scientocracy that I think should be required reading for everyone. In that essay, Lewis, it was called Willing Slaves of the Welfare State. And in that essay, Lewis said this, I dread government in the name of science. That is how tyrannies come in. In every age, the man who wants us under their, their thumb, the men who want us under their thumb, if they have any sense, will put forward the particular pretension which the hopes and fears of that age render most potent. They cash in. It has been magic. It has been Christianity. Now it will certainly be science. Lewis also predicted the new oligarchy must more and more base its claim to plan us on its claim to knowledge. This means they must increasingly rely on the advice of scientists till in the end, the politicians proper become merely the scientists' puppets. Now, I think Lewis was eerily prophetic. And you don't need to look far today to see science being misused as a wedge, pretty much of authoritarianism. Let's take the area of ecology, where some scientists are proposing draconian measures to protect biodiversity. This man is evolutionary zoologist Eric Pianca at the University of Texas, Austin. In the name of science, Dr. Pianca says we must reduce the Earth's human population by up to 90%. And he calls on government officials to confiscate all the earnings, all the earnings of any couple who has more than two children. Or let's look at criminal justice. The presumption of innocence and the right to confront your accusers has been uh, hallmarks of a civilized criminal justice system, but they are now under attack in the name of science. In the name of science, judges across America are deciding who stays in jail based on computer algorithms that purport to predict whether an accused person will reoffend. These algorithms typically are proprietary and confidential, and not even judges or defense attorneys are allowed to review the underlying assumptions of the models. Uh, judges and defense attorneys are just supposed to trust the scientific expertise of the professors who wrote the algorithm. Uh, in the area of medicine, decisions about medical care once left to patients and their families are increasingly being made by doctors and even government in the name of superior scientific expertise. Patients or families who disagree now find that they have little or no say over the life or death decisions of their loved ones. If a doctor or hospital decides that your child does not merit further medical treatment, not only will you have no power to override their decision, you may even be prohibited from seeking medical treatment for your child in another facility, as we saw with the infamous case of baby Alfie in England, 
uh, a couple of years ago. Also, in the name of science, many are abandoning their commitments to free speech. Uh, Professor Lawrence Torcello at the Rochester Institute of Technology argues, for example, that global warming skeptics should be charged with criminal negligence. Journalist Adam Weinstein, journalist used to support free speech, journalist Adam Weinstein says that global warming skeptics should, quote, face jail, they should face fines, they should face lawsuits, unquote. So much for free speech, all in the name of science. Then we have the areas of religion and morality, where science is being promoted as a substitute for the moral and spiritual authority of traditional religion. So we have Science is my savior, as the title of an article written by Scientific American columnist Michael Shermer a few years back. Or we have the idea that science can determine what's moral and immoral, according to a book by neuroscientist Sam Harris. And we even have self-described transhumanists like Nick Bostrom and Julian Savalescu, who offer a vision of humans evolving into a new godlike race through the magic of scientific breeding. And then, of course, there is COVID-19. In the name of science, some public health experts are currently advocating continuing shutdowns of much of society, including churches, seemingly in perpetuity, or at least for a year or more. And social media giants Twitter and Facebook are imposing censorship of any scientists who dissent from this week's scientific orthodoxy, which may not be the same as last week's orthodoxy. Now, I think this growing authoritarianism in the name of science should concern all of us wherever we fall on the political spectrum. And I'd like to offer a few reasons why our drift toward Scientocracy is such a bad idea in my view. Number one, scientists aren't nearly as objective or neutral as people seem to think. Now, I think far too many Americans uh, accept what I would call the myth of the scientist in the white lab coat. That is, when they think about scientists, they visualize people like, in this photo, in lab coats who have been trained to be impartial, factual, and objective in everything. According to one survey, nearly two thirds of Americans see scientists as neither particularly liberal nor conservative. They think of them as nonpartisan and neutral. The reality is rather different. A nationwide survey of 2,500 plus scientists conducted by Pew Forum in conjunction with the American Association for the Advancement of Science unequivocally showed that scientists as a group are far from neutral or nonpartisan. Consider uh, political ideology. 52% of scientists identify themselves as liberal. Only 9% classify themselves as conservative. That makes scientists four times less likely than the general public to identify as conservative, and it makes scientists 2.6 times more likely to identify as liberals as the general public. Or let's look at party affiliation. A whopping 6% of scientists identify as Republicans, whereas 55% identify as Democrats. Again, completely unrepresentative of the population as a whole. Scientists' belief about public policy closely track with their underlying ideology. Consider the statement, when something is run by the government, it is usually inefficient and wasteful. 57% of the public agrees with that statement. 58% of scientists disagree. Another statement, the best way to ensure peace is through military strength. 53% of the public agree. 65% of scientists disagree. And scientists can be just as smitten by their political heroes as everyone else. Take the illustrious Dr. Fauci. Thanks to WikiLeaks, we know that one of Dr. Fauci's favorite persons in politics is Hillary Clinton. And in fact, he sent her effusive emails uh, to her through her staff. Please tell her that we all love her and are very proud to know her, he wrote once. Please tell the secretary that I love her more than ever, he wrote in another email. Doesn't exactly sound impartial, does it? But it's not just political ideology where scientists aren't representative of the general public. Uh, they are even less representative in the area of religion. Let's look at this. 
according to surveys. Again, 83% of the general public believes in God, and 33% of scientists do. Think about that. Religion impacts our deepest views about the world and what's important. There is a cavernous gulf in this area between most scientists and most of the general public. The bottom line is that when dealing with pronouncements from scientists on public policy, let alone culture, people need to understand that there is little neutral about scientists as a class in America. In particular, they are grossly unrepresentative of the population as a whole, unrepresentative ideologically, politically, religiously. It's therefore highly questionable to treat scientists as a class as if they are necessarily objective or impartial whenever they speak on politics or culture. Many may try to be, but the simple fact of the matter is that one's underlying worldview can't help but impact the rest of one's views. And so is it really wise to delegate public authority, or would it be wise to delegate public authority to a group that is so unrepresentative of the public as a whole? Okay. Reason two why Scientocracy would be such a bad idea is that science is a whole lot more fallible than its boosters typically claim. Now, the promoters of basing public policy on science seem supremely confident in the ability of scientists to objectively and accurately arrive at the truth in a timely manner. And scientists do have many amazing achievements to their credit, but they also have many stupendous failures. Science is many things, an infallible oracle it is not. If you have been following the news at all closely during the COVID-19 pandemic, you probably have seen this already. In the space of weeks, we have seen how various expert projections from scientists of catastrophic numbers of deaths and hospitalizations have turned out to be catastrophically wrong, yet public policies were based on those wrong uh, models. Uh, we've gone from the World Health Organization claiming in January that there is no clear evidence of human-to-human -human transmission of COVID-19 to believing that the virus is highly contagious between humans. Uh, we've gone from scientists insisting that masks are absolutely useless and even dangerous for ordinary people to wear to being told that masks are so critical that they must be mandated for everyone. We've gone from Dr. Anthony Fauci telling us that COVID-19 wouldn't be a problem in January, uh, that it was perfectly safe to go on cruise ships, something he said in March, uh, and safe to go to the gym and to movie theaters, which I think he said at the end of uh, February, to being told that we all need to be locked down in our homes for months on end or disaster will ensue. The thing is, anyone who knows anything about the history of science will be able to tell you that these kinds of scientific failures are not exceptional. They are a normal part of science, which after all is a fallible human enterprise, just like other fallible human enterprises. Uh, a handful of some examples from the history of science. One of the biggest was eugenics. In the early decades of the 20th century, America's leading biologists had the bright idea that they could breed better humans through what was called eugenics. Eugenics was the effort to breed and direct human evolution through forced sterilization and other methods based on an understanding of Darwinian biology. These scientists turned out to be wrong, and later scientists regarded eugenics as little more than junk science. Or take the lobotomy. A lobotomy is brain surgery where they sever connections in your prefrontal cortex. They actually used a modified ice pick in your <laughs> to screw things up. Uh, in the 1940s, lobotomies were marketed as a miracle cure for mental illness by leading scientists who promoted it as, quote, always safe, unquote. Someone even won a Nobel Prize for helping to develop the procedure. By the 1950s, an estimated 50,000 Americans were lobotomized. But then it turned out that it could render people severely incapacitated and that the procedure had many more side effects than originally believed. Wasn't quite as safe as they thought. Then, during our own lifetimes, we've experienced the consensus view of scientists that proteins that don't code for DNA were functionless junk DNA, leftovers from the haphazard process of unguided Darwinian evolution. Yet now, in a stunning reversal, scientists increasingly believe that much of so-called junk DNA does perform biological functions. The belief that most of our genome consisted of junk DNA may turn out to be one of the biggest scientific blunders of the past century. And then final example, 
algorithms. As I mentioned earlier, there's a movement to use computer algorithms to predict scientifically who will reoffend in the criminal justice system and then to base uh, decisions on incarceration about that. Uh, they're also being used in uh, social social work areas and uh, social programs. In 2014, Los Angeles County used an algorithm to try to predict which children and which families were at the highest risk for child abuse to target uh, those families. It was sold again in the name of science. And the algorithm did correctly predict abuse in 171 cases, but it falsely predicted abuse in 3,829 cases. In other words, it was wrong 96% of the time. Okay. A third reason Scientocracy isn't a great idea. Science isn't as self-correcting as its defenders insist. We're often told today that science is so wonderful because it's so self-critical and self-correcting. Well, not always. Take the eugenics crusade again. Eugenics wasn't just promoted by a handful of fringe scientists. For decades, it was the consensus view of the scientific community in America and Europe, pushed uncritically by evolutionary biologists and other scientists at Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, Yale, the National Academy of Sciences. They were people uh, you know, uh, that were very uncritical of this. On the other hand, the people who were the most critical came from outside science. They were people of faith, particularly Catholics uh, and a few evangelical Protestants. And, and these critics were actually criticized by the scientists at the time uh, as anti-science because they dared to criticize the scientific consensus on eugenics. What finally killed eugenics was not the scientific community, but revulsion from the public after post-World War II revelations about the Nazi eugenics program. So much for self-correcting science. A fourth and final reason why Scientocracy is a bad idea. Scientists have tunnel vision. Scientists aren't experts in everything, and they tend to focus on the things they know, which makes sense. That's admirable when it comes to science research, but it's a disaster when it comes to public policy. Deaths from COVID-19 are terrible, and I don't wanna make light of that at all, but so are deaths from depression, child abuse, untreated cancer, and many other things. So are violations of free speech, free assembly, and free exercise of religion. So is the lack of in-person human interactions, especially for children. So is the taking away of people's livelihoods. Public policy is rarely, if ever, about pursuing one good to the exclusion of all others. It requires reconciling competing goods. Yet scientists aren't moral philosophers and they are not experts in everything. So they have no special expertise in how to reconcile competing goods. Again, C.S. Lewis, I think, is quite wise here. He wrote, I dread specialists in power because they are specialists speaking outside their special subjects. Let scientists tell us about sciences, but government involves questions about the good for man and justice and what things are worth having at what price. And on these, a scientific training gives a man's opinion no added value. I think Lewis was right. So what's my suggested antidote to the drive toward Scientocracy? Well, since I had four problems of Scientocracy, I have four suggestions uh, with which I will conclude. Uh, number one is practice healthy skepticism. Good science isn't determined by decree, it's determined by the evidence. And just because a scientist makes a claim doesn't mean he or she is right. As my friend John Lennox likes to say, nonsense remains nonsense even when talked about by world famous scientists. So when scientists make claims in order to demand new laws or regulations or government spending or, or things that they want the criminal justice system to do, ask them to explain the evidence backing up their views. Don't just accept their assertions. They're not the voice of God. Two, we need to defend free speech in science. For all the talk of scientific consensus, science advances when scientists are free to raise new ideas. Yesterday's heresies can become tomorrow's orthodoxies. 
On the other hand, if you want to stop the progress of science, by all means, shut down the right of the dissenter. Do what the social media giants are doing and remove videos or tweets, even by doctors and scientists, if they raise uncomfortable questions or make arguments you don't like. Censorship is a recipe for stopping progress, not advancing it. And then three, I think we need to insist that policymakers recruit scientists who disagree with each other. Government scientists engaged in crafting public policy get flabby and lazy when they are treated like the voice of God. It now appears that a couple of government scientists convinced uh, our president and the White House to pursue a strategy of a national shutdown based largely on a faulty model issued by the Imperial College in the UK. Other epidemiologists were skeptical, but they didn't have a voice in the process. Politicians may not have the resources to ask experts tough questions themselves, but they should recruit a diverse group of experts who can question and challenge each other. Dr. Fauci, as great as he may be, would be a far better scientist if he was forced to confront intelligent questions and criticism from fellow scientists during the deliberations on public policy, rather than simply basking in the glow of adoring fans who proclaim, in Fauci we trust. Okay, final suggestion. We need to make the case that scientists alone shouldn't dictate public policy. Scientists should advise, but most public policy questions aren't just science questions. Shutting down the country is not just a science question. And so scientists like Dr. Fauci or anyone else shouldn't have the only voices at the table. To cite C.S. Lewis again, government involves questions about the good for man and justice and what things are worth having at what price. And on these, a scientific training gives a man's opinion no added value. Thanks for listening, and I hope I've said something to stir your curiosity. Um, before we do q and I just wanted to say that if you'd like to learn more about issues relating to science and scientism, I'd encourage you to sign up for one of Discovery Institute's free email newsletters. Uh, and just for signing up, we'll send you uh, three free chapters from my book, The Magician's Twin, on C.S. Lewis and scientism, and also a chapter by Brian Miller, who's gonna be talking in a little while, from The Mystery of Life's Origin. And with that, I see that Thomas is back, so we can do some Q&A. Great, and you finished a little early, which is perfect because we've got a lot of questions. I encourage anyone that has more questions, throw it in that Q&A uh, tab instead of the chat tab. Um, but let me ask the first one, just as moder moderator's privilege. Um, you know, for you, what, what do you think the telos of a scientist should be? So what I mean by that is, you know, for example, in the, in the part of science that's the study of diseases, we're sort of treating it like the goal is to eradicate disease. Is that what we should be doing? Should we try to eradicate more mortality? Uh, how do, you know, where do we draw the line? You know, I think that telos of a scientist, of a natural scientist primarily, should be to discover the facts and, and the empirical reality about the world. And that when they begin to get into, well, what should we do as society? What should our overall goals be for society? That is the telos of overall society. And I think that then they become one of many voices. And I think that's actually what Lewis was getting at when he used, when he referred in the abolition of man, which I didn't really talk about, uh, of science being uh, the twin of magic. And he distinguished science as a quest for knowledge about the world, which he thought was quite exemplary, and science as a quest for power over the world and power to do things and power to get other people to do things. And so I, you know, I, I think natural curiosity of wanting to understand the wonders of nature is, is a wonderful thing for scientists to do. I think they need to be appropriately humble that science is not the be all end all of everything. It doesn't tell you what's just. It doesn't tell you what is tyrannical. It doesn't tell you whether say five deaths in one area are worse than five deaths in another area. And it doesn't actually balance out, say, say you do save some deaths by, say, shutting down free speech. Well, how do you balance that out? And so mm -hmm. I think the real dangerous thing is we're treating scientists as if, and that's why I started out with all these quotes, and I had about 10 of them, but I didn't want to use them all, from politicians saying, we're following the scientists. We're just doing what the scientists say. In fact, some governors are, when they're criticizing and saying, well, I'm just doing what the scientists tell us. I'm trying mm -hmm. to get people to think that's not sufficient. Right. 
Okay. Uh, this one is from Will Wilkin. Uh, he asks, what about religionism? Uh, when people claim their religious beliefs invalidate science. So I think that's, that's a great uh, issue. And uh, I think that um, certainly throughout uh, history, there has been, a, there have been problems of people saying, let us rule society because thus does the Lord and I'm or the, the divine right of Kings or something else. And certainly there are uh, some uh, religious groups who may have questions on, on various things. Having said that, if you really look at the overall history of science, uh, this idea that science and war are religion or that, you know, that, that the mid Middle Ages, for example, were the dark ages because they were trying to frustrate the rise of scientists. You think of Galileo, you think the flat earth, which actually educated people didn't believe, wasn't really an issue, it wasn't being pushed by uh, church people. Uh, if you look at the totality of things, uh, religion was far more, particularly in the Judeo-Christian tradition, was far more an impetus for science and scientific discovery than it was any sort of harm toward science. And I think that's true today. Um, if you actually look at surveys and things, uh, most people who believe in religion, are, they accept uh, science and they accept the findings of science. They do critique uh, certain things about it, uh, certain public policy claims, claims like, and claims that get into moral claims, like say embryonic stem cell research. There are two questions there. One is whether it works. Turns out, actually, it wasn't a great, uh, I, mean, I mean, scientists as a whole, I think, have come to the conclusion that embryonic stem cell research, as opposed to adult stem cell research, really wasn't actually a great, um, uh, 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 you know, thing uh, to do. I mean, it wasn't really very productive uh, for treatments. But then a lot of the people who are criticizing it were raising ethical issues about if you believe that the human embryos are, are fully alive and human, then they had ethical objections. Well, that's not anti-science uh, mm -hmm. to raise ethical objections, and that's not going against uh, you know, a certain treatment or something. And so I think although that is an important question to raise, I think the totality of things is we really are, don't have a problem today with lots of religious people as a whole attacking science or saying, you know, let's go back to the age before the toaster oven or microwaves or computers, or uh, I'm not going to take, or, you know, vaccines. There are a lot of debates over vaccines, but the overwhelming number of Americans, you know, we're talking about nine, plus than 90% get vaccines. And, and the particular questions about vaccines with a couple of exceptions are on a, on a couple of really factual issues that maybe people are wrong, maybe they're right on, but it's not a rejection of vaccines. And so there really isn't that today. There are lots of people, including public officials right now, claiming we just need to do what scientists say. And usually it's a subset of scientists. So I, I'm more concerned by that than I am uh, about religion. Right, good answer. Um, this one is from Scott Turner. He says, how do you draw out the hidden conservative scientists? They're there, but they're disempowered. How do we re-empower them? Yeah, well, that's a that's a good uh, question. I think it goes to uh, really having a robust view of free speech and that people shouldn't just be demonized for uh, having a different view. And so this goes beyond science. I mean, now everyone's debating censorship. And, you know, look, it's true. There are some wacky people out there. There are people who deny the Holocaust. Do I think they're great? Do I think they have? No, they're terrible. I, on the other hand, we, we have a tendency to always ratchet up that if you have a different view than I do, then uh, you're tantamount to a Holocaust denier. I mean, the number of times I've heard that in the science realm, that no matter what you, you raise a question on, they'll always say, oh, you're like a Holocaust denier. That is just a manipulation tactic. I'm sorry. There is a wide, there's a wide, uh, a lot of alternatives and, and, and you know, a wide berth for dissent between someone who is really kooky and out there and say denies the Holocaust or something. And then someone say, who has differences of opinion on say, how much natural selection acting on random variations can really do in the history of life of which lots of evolutionary scientists have had questions on that. And so, I'd say the number one thing is to legitimize the legitimacy of dissent and how important that can be. I mean, to recapture the, the, the larger Western tradition, people like John Milton in his, in his famous treatise, Aeropagitica, you know, let truth and error grapple and that we shouldn't be afraid of that. And that that is, even though there are costs to free speech, that the downside 
is worse. So I think actually that culture of being willing to, and, and calling people out, one more thing, calling people out when they make illegitimate comparisons and say, well, that's like claiming the flat earth, or that's like denying the Holocaust. Now, if someone really is nutty and that's an appropriate comparison, okay. But a lot of times people are using it as shorthand to not have to argue something out and calling the bluff on that when people use that sort of Reddit rhetorical overkill. Okay. Um, I'm trying to net. So James Ausland and Tom Winkler both have proposals of um, public debate systems. Uh, so I... I, I won't tell you what, what the individual proposals of them are, but I mean, I guess just broadly, um, you know, what do you think? I mean, you're, the um, if we have this problem with just deference to experts, should we instead defer to, you know, the public opinion and, you know, you know, especially on issues that are, um, you know, controversial? So, so that's a great uh, question. I'm glad you raised it because I don't want to be, uh, although I was somewhat critical of expert knowledge, it, it's not... Um, Expert knowledge is important. I mean, if I ha want to have brain surgery, I'm not going to choose someone who had a mail order degree from a post office box in some other country. You know, I want someone who is genuinely an expert on that. And so I, I, I give full force to the claim that in today's technologically driven society and modern society, expert knowledge is important. Yes. The problem is that um, experts can be fallible just like anyone else. And I'll tell you, although my PhD is in government, once you go to graduate school, you get a PhD, become a college professor like I was for 12 years and, a tenure, and earn tenure, you get cocky. And you also learn that when students raise things in classes, you earn, basically learn to BS. You learn to make up stuff, not make up, but you, you know, sound more authoritative than you actually are. And so this idea that experts or any one expert is like the voice of God. That's what I'm trying to, to get against. That's why I actually suggest one of the best things politicians can do, because sometimes I talk to political officials and they say, we're not experts. That's right, they're not. So I don't expect them to be experts. But that doesn't give them a pass of judging and making a decision. Judges aren't experts. They have to hear what people come to their courtroom on both sides. So I think uh, getting diverse experts, say in the current COVID-19, there are lots of uh, experts at, at, at Stanford, at Harvard, epidemiologists who are very well credentialed and thoughtful and published who may have a different point of view than say some of our government experts and i think the government experts if they were thrown in the room with them not just with some people from congress who are asking scripted questions that their aides have written you know if if you know the white house task force say was actually a task force of diverse voices that the politician could see them go at it you know they could be their BS detector or baloney detector by having those diverse experts. Okay, so um, I apologize because a million questions came in all at once a second ago. I have some quick, quick ones so I get my head around it. Um, are, are you are, are you concerned about the rise of bioethics as a authoritative uh, discipline? Yeah, um, because it's often. Um, as a formal discipline, it, it, it is often tied to institutional uh, medical establishments, say in hospital review boards that basically serve to rubber stamp what the doctors want. And again, doctors are important and uh, doctors are, are wonderful. And on the other hand, we've always believed that, pay, especially coming out of the experience of World War II, that patients and their families have a lot of say. And I think people should be very concerned when cases like baby Alfie in the UK, but there are similar cases here, where not only do the parents disagree, and you know, you can make judgments that, um, can we afford doing certain medical things to the umpteenth? Maybe not. But in the baby Alfie case, it, it went further than that. They found other hospitals that were willing to do treatment and the government actually <laughs> forbade the parents from taking their own baby to another hospital for treatment. That's scary. In our, in our own country, we had a case a couple of years ago of Justina Pelletier, uh, Pelletier in, in Massachusetts. She was being treated for one disease by a doctor from Tufts University, quite credible. But she had to go into the emergency room into a Massachusetts hospital, and she had an internist or someone who was not nearly as experienced decided that she was making it up. That was it was just in her psychology. It was just a, a fake disease, and took her off the drugs. 
Her parents disagreed. Her other doctor disagreed. She was forcibly incarcerated because she was under 18 in a psych ward for months and months against her wishes, against her other doctor's wishes, against her parents' wishes, because a hospital internist made a decision that went different to them. That is appalling. And if that, if you're not appalled by that, you shouldn't be an American citizen. I mean, because, I mean, that's just appalling. Absolutely. Um, would a scientist ever say that they are practicing scientism? Well, you know, again, I, I think there are lots of very wonderful scientists and wonderfully humble doctors um, that that uh, actually try to advise, but not try to force and try to lay out the facts. And I could think of doctors, uh, our own pediatrician uh, that we use in our family, uh, who was just really, if anything, too non-directive because he laid out all the different facts and said, well, what, what do you recommend? Uh, and, and so I think there are a lot of scientists that are humble. Um, I do think those that are engaging in scientism usually don't know it. <laughs> and that's, uh, yeah, they're blind. So this is from Martin Bell. Do you agree with the Bible when it says man dominates man to his detriment? Well, I, I think I agree with human nature, even apart from the Bible. I, I do happen to be a Christian, so I, I, I do accept the biblical understanding of human nature. But I think that you don't need to go to the Bible to see that human beings dominate each other. And that's just uh, uh, actually Timothy Dwight, who was a president of Harvard and a Congregationalist minister, once gave a sermon in the early 1800s where he basically said, looking at the depravity of man, you don't have to look at the Bible, just look at how we treat each other. So, uh, yeah. Um. This is from Paul Vickers. Do the internal politics of the science establish and encourage, encourage scientific overreach into politics? Uh, if, if so, how much? Yeah. And COVID, I think, is a good example. Well, I think the uh, internal dynamic of the public health establishment uh, is, is that. Um, we've seen that actually in our state, uh, in Washington State, where uh, people objected to having handing out um, clean needles and things to drug addicts that raises a lot of different questions. And so people were trying to get an initiative to actually overturn that. And the argument of the scientist was that this is a professional health matter. And so voters and, and citizens have no say. Hmm. This was within the last year. And so this mentality you're seeing in COVID, I think is endemic in the public health establishment and understand the public health establishment was largely the ones who were insisting on forced sterilization for people who were not even mentally handicapped for eugenics. So the, I'd say for me, the, the, the biggest challenge that is that scientists know very little about the history of science. Uh, and that's the problem. So they studied their scientific disciplines, but they get maybe a few paragraphs about the history of science in their textbooks. And it basically goes along like this, is that from triumph to triumph, that you know, once we were in the days of superstition and then modern science came along and we've gone from triumph to triumph, they did, if they were actually had a, something taught by a historian of science, they would learn that actually science has a pretty um, fallible track record because it's a human discipline and that scientists have like the eugenics crusade. The reason I bring this up is that in my experience in talking to scientists, they know about it, but here's what they think they know about it. Eugenics was a case where politicians misused science to impose things like forced sterilization. They don't know that the politicians from 1900 to about 1940 in America were doing what they said, what the scientists were telling them. The scary thing about eugenics is not that there was politicians who abuse science, it's that the leading scientists at Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Stanford, National Academy of Sciences were saying this was the consensus view of science and therefore politicians had to do it. And until our scientists actually study the true history of science, not just from triumph to triumph, but also the downside of the group think that takes place in science and the overreach, I don't think they're going to get more humble as an, as an overall uh, uh, institution. Right. Um, this one, oh, sorry, just lost. Okay, yeah, this one's from Reed Burns. Is the timeline proposed for COVID-19 vaccine scientific or politically driven? Uh, and is it possible for it to accomplish based on what we know today? So I'm not an expert on, on, on that. And so I'm not going to, I don't even pretend to play a scientist on TV, like those doctors just doing those commercials saying I'm, you know, I, I pretend to play one on TV. I, I will say that 
um, there are concerns. Uh, I mean, if you consider, the, the, if you look at the history, uh, when we had the swine flu epidemic and there was a rush to get a vaccine, and then in retrospect, there were some issues like Guillain-Barre syndrome and other stuff that's widely accepted, not just, I know there are critics of vaccines and things, but I mean, just widely mainstream understands that there were problems. And so there are problems of rushing vaccines. And I'd say one of the things you have to balance out is your likelihood of getting it or dying from it. And so, again, I'm not a doctor, not giving medical advice, but if you, um, uh, but you know, that, that can be a, a, an issue that if you're in a very low likelihood of getting it or, or getting really sick from it, then you may have to balance out those things. But I, I really can't speak to that. Right. Well, I mean, I think timelines in general, when it comes to having, you have to come up with something like a vaccine by this time, sounds pretty politically motivated to me, at least. To, um, I don't know how you how you know for sure when you'll come up with something by. Well, there's pressure. I mean, people are feeling right. pressured, yeah. and I get it. Yeah. Oops. I think I sort of lost you for a second. Yeah, my my uh, video seems to be frozen, but I'm still getting audio. So oh, okay, um, I can hear you. Uh, so uh, let me ask you one more question then. Um, um, how can we, this is from Chase Blosser? How can we prevent scientists from believing that they know uh, all there is to know and and a given subject, uh, or that they know best? I think forcing them to take a, a course taught by a historian of science and not rely on their graduate school textbooks that may have two paragraphs or two pages about the history of science would be an eye-opening experience and probably the best thing uh, ever. Right. Um, okay, it sounds like good advice. Uh, I want to remind everyone, by the way, that we pinned to the top of the chat a link to that book, um, Darwin Day in America, published by ISI. And uh, as you can see on your screen now, there's a special offer um, from the Discovery Institute. Um, and Dr. West, our time is up. I want to thank you uh, for your time. Thanks for coming on here uh, and for all the hard work you do at the Discovery Institute. Um, and with that, I think I will, uh, if you are listening, Bob Marks, please you know, enable your video um, and join us. Um, see. Uh, and John West, you know, we'll say goodbye to you. Um, while we wait for Dr. Marks, um, I'm going to uh, read a quick word from our sponsor. Um, hold on. So are you tired of progressive orthodoxy on campus, eager to go beyond the narrow range of debate in the classroom? Learn the timeless principles of liberty so you can pursue truth and freedom. ISI introduces students to the American tradition of liberty and to a vi vibrant community of students and scholars. Our members get an education and community they don't find in their universities. And in the process, they become articulate voices for conservative principles. To get the college education you deserve, become a member at join.isi.org. Um, so it's join.isi.org. It's the best way to get plugged in, hear about the next things that we're doing, read our incredible resources. I encourage everyone to do it if you haven't done it yet. Um, Okay. Um, all right. Dr. Marks is on here. Um, let me see if I can pull a meme up. Um, my computer seems to have slowed down somehow. Uh, I hope you guys can all still see me. Um, let's see. So, uh, Dr. Marks, you will be uh, talking about AI. So I have an AI themed meme um, if it ever loads. Um, I don't know what what slowed my computer down today. Well, great, greetings, Thomas. I think that everybody has introduced themselves at least on the, of a chat and where they're from. I'm coming you coming to you from the great state of Texas in the city of Corpus Christi, and it's beautiful here. We're going to go swimming after uh, after we listen to Doctor. Go to the beach. I, have a good time. Remain our social distance, of course. I think everybody is jealous these days of anybody that happens to have a pool. Um, Amen. Yep. While Thomas is uploading the slides, the, the title of my talk is AI uh, Menace or Savior. 
And let me give you the elevator pitch of exactly what it is. The answer is, uh, yes, it's a savior and a menace. AI itself is neither good nor bad. It's a tool and it's a tool like electricity. In fact, I heard a Silicon Valley person refer to artificial intelligence as the new electricity. And just like we use electricity everywhere and it's really enriched our lives a lot, it doesn't mean that everything about electricity is good. We still have shorted wires and houses that burn them down and electricians still get shocked and electrocuted every year. So it's good, it's bad, it's just a tool, it's out there. AI is gonna be something which is very, very similar. Now, it does turn out, and this is, this, if I remember, is uh, where I wanted to start out. We are currently surrounded by AI, but we're numbed by familiarity. We're kind of caught by the shiny object. Look at this, look at that, look at that. But if you look at some of the applications of artificial intelligence, there's Uber, there's Google Maps, there's Alexa, uh, which is incredible. I guess I have to mention Google Home if I mention Alexa. But there is, uh, there, there, there's, there's Lyft, there's Spotify. I love Spotify. Um, and a number of other applications. I remember when email first came out. Yes, I'm that old. And I was told email is gonna be great. It's gonna save us so much time because no longer do you have to write a letter, properly format it, fold it up and put it in an envelope and mail it and take a couple of days. It is going to make our lives so much easier. And indeed, it's been just the <laughs> Just the opposite. Email dominates my life. I spend a lot of time every day uh, just on the email. So you think that AI is going to simplify your life, but it doesn't. Uh, I think of all of the calls that I make now that have voice recognition that tell me I have to wait and what is my social security number and date of birth and all these other things. It's uh, simply frustrating. Thomas, I saw you. You were flash in the uh, flash in the night there. I'm here. Uh, I'll let you continue. Um, okay. Do you, <laughs> I can continue. Uh, let, do you need uh, yeah, let me see. Introduce yourself already. Okay. Oh, first of all, okay, I'll introduce myself. I'm, uh, I'm Robert Marks. Uh, I am a distinguished professor. That's better than a professor. I'm distinguished at Baylor University. And I have been doing artificial intelligence for the past 30 years. I was in on the first revolution of artificial intelligence in the 80s and 90s and have continued on up until the present day. I'm also the director of the Walter Bradley Center for Natural and Artificial Intelligence. That's an arm of Discovery Institute. And the website for the Walter Bradley Center for Natural and Artificial Intelligence is mindmatters.ai. That's mindmatters.ai. AI. And for listeners today at this seminar, we do have a special um, offer for you. I recently wrote a book, a very thin book called The Case for Killer Robots. Why artificial intelligence, autonomous and otherwise, needs to be considered for use in warfare. And it is a pushback against <clears throat> many organizations that are trying to ban autonomous AI because of unfounded fears. If you'd like a free e-copy of that book, A Case for Killer Robots, simply go to mindmatters.ai, and then I believe it's slash offers. And uh, if, if offer, I think it's singular. And if you don't, if you go to mindmatters.ai, we are going to have up in the, up in the upper portion, a little bar on top, we will have the, a place where you can click and actually get the book. Uh, get the book for your edification and enjoyment. Right. Well, and I apologize, by the way, for my technological failure. I think it wouldn't be a conversation about robots if we didn't have some technology have an issue. Um, <laughs> I meant to read your introduction. I'm sorry that that wasn't clear, That, but you've now introduced yourself. So I guess I can just bow out. I'll come back uh, on the screen in 25 minutes to do Q&A with you. And, uh, okay, it sounds good. Thank you, Thomas. Okay. So have I access to my slides now? Yes, just click slides and then click your presentation. Slide, slide, slides. Slide, yeah. slides, okay. Ah, there they are, okay, open. Okay, here's the title of my talk. Notice I have 85 slides. 
but I'm not going to go through all 85. You'll be glad to know. Uh, much of them are reserved for potential Q and A sort of uh, sort of questions. Here are some of the different applications of artificial intelligence that we're surrounded by so much that we kind of take them for advantage. And uh, that is really cool, the way that artificial intelligence has impacted our lives. It's, uh, it's frankly been amazing. But again, we're numbed by familiarity. We're kind of distracted by the shiny new object, the great new artificial intelligence that is happening somewhere at some place. Here are the landmarks accomplishment in modern AI. 20 years ago, Kasparov was beaten by a computer program called IBM Deep Blue. And Deep Blue beat Kasparov in chess, which was considered a monumental, a monumental achievement. And uh, the next thing to happen was that uh, IBM Watson took on the world's challengers in, or, or the world's champions in the quiz show Jeopardy, where in order to win, you have to have knowledge of the entire world. They ask you, well, they don't answer you questions. They, they give you the answers and you ask the questions. It's kind of a weird format. But uh, anyway, Watson had to his, um, at his discretion, all of Wikipedia, probably the Encyclopedia Britannica and everything on the web. And it whipped the human champions in jeopardy, really an incredible result. And then the big gauntlet, this has been the holy grail of artificial intelligence for many years, is AlphaGo winning the game of Go against the world championship in Go. Go is primarily an Asian game, and I, I have never played Go, but if you look at the rules of Go and the complications of Go, Go is to chess as chess is to checkers. It is an enormously more complicated game, and the fact that artificial intelligence could win against the world champion is really an astonishing result. Well, because of this, the Moody, the the, um, the press came out and say, said, "Well, all sorts of speculations. Now that we have something like AlphaGo, we can probably get rid of CEOs. We can get rid of commanders on the battlefield." We can get rid of a lot of people in the world. In fact, let's get troubled about it because it's going to replace so many jobs that we won't know, uh, we won't be able to replace them all. These are speculations. And what I want to do in my address is number one, uh, talk about some of the hype which comes out with artificial neural networks. This dovetails artificial intelligence. This dovetails with John West talk because a lot of this comes from people who are so called experts that don't know about artificial intelligence and uh, they mislead people for a number of reasons which we'll talk about. Then in order for us to understand artificial intelligence, I want to get to the fundamental limitations of artificial intelligence. There are things which artificial intelligence will never do. They are claimed to be possible in the future, but if you look at the world of artificial intelligence, you find out that indeed it is not possible to do and we're going to establish these uh, Get th these guidelines, these limitations of artificial intelligence in this talk. Uh, John talked about uh, scientocracy and scientism, and we have that in artificial intelligence, people that are worried to death of all the things that are going to happen with artificial intelligence. Bill Gates, as you see here, says, I don't understand why some people are not concerned about artificial intelligence. Uh, we would like to think that Bill Gates is a, a computer nerd. He isn't. He knows how to code a computer, but his business is, uh, the business of Microsoft was based on uh, acquisition, uh, lawsuits, and, uh, and and clever market manipulations, and very little to do with uh, with actual technical innovations. So take that into account when you hear things from Bill Gates. I can, if somebody wants to ask me about that question later or, or about that uh, later on, we can talk about it. But here's a guy that should know his stuff, Stephen Hawking. He says the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. My goodness, that's scary stuff. It would take off on its own and redesign itself at an ever increasing rate. Humans who are limited by slow biological evolution could compete and could be superseded. Now Hawking's statement here, has a supposition in it, which we will show is incorrect. He assumes that artificial intelligence could be creative. Now we're gonna to have to define exactly what we mean by creative, but in order for compute, for AI to write better and better software, it has to be creative. And artificial intelligence does not have that capability as we will be talking about. 
I, I think it's ironic that Stephen Hawking um, abandoned his search for everything because of Kurt Gerdell's incompleteness theorem. But Kurt Gerdell's incompleteness theorem is modified by a guy named Alan Turing actually exposes the limits of things that artificial intelligence can do. But Hawking never made that, uh, that connection. Then we have the billionaire Elon Musk. He says, with artificial intelligence, we are summoned by the demon. Elon Musk is clearly a genius entrepreneur. George Gilder, who is one of the founders of Discovery Institute in a recent interview, said of Musk, he says, I think Elon Musk is a tremendous entrepreneur, but he's quite a retarded thinker. So we should admire Elon Musk, Stephen Hawking, and Bill Gates for what they've done, but question their uh, going outside of their areas of expertise. Now, there are some people with expertise that have made similar sort of uh, statements, such as Ray Kurzweil, and we would have to go nose to nose to them on some of these um, some of these things. Well, let's first of all talk about the hype. These are the things which are in artificial intelligence that we have to be aware of. Artificial intelligence is um, is in the news. It's in the news a lot, and it is hyped a lot. Let's look at some of the uh, examples. Here are a few headlines that I pulled from the web. <clears throat> in the upper left, neuroscientists translate brainwaves into recognizable speech. Wow, you read this and you believe that you have to get some tin foil and make a little bit of hat, a little hat out of tin foil in order to protect your brain. On the right, how can we prepare for catastrophically dangerous AI and why we can't wait? This is clearly a leading headline because they assume that AI is going to be catastrophically dangerous. Right below that, the truth about killer robots, the year's most uh, terrifying documentary. And you can see the other things uh, that are on here. Uh, of some of the other headlines. But uh, there's a problem with them, and we're going to talk about what those problems are. A lot of these are simply junk AI news. Why do we have it? First of all, it's fake click or fake news clickbait. The idea is these writers want you to click on their story so that when their story views that you have advertisements which pop up and they get paid for the advertisements, so they have clickbait headlines such as you saw on the previous slide. There are many untutored journalists, journalists that believe they are experts at AI and write misleading untutored articles about artificial intelligence. Many people like to promote their research, so we have research promotion here. Research promotion would mean a company wants to promote a new chip that they made or a professor wants to um, popularize a current area of research that he or she is interested in, in order to get uh, additional federal funding. And of course, we are always accompanied by conspiracy nuts who believe weird things about aliens at area whatever, and, uh, and flying saucers abducting them, et cetera. So there's always gonna be the conspiracy nuts uh, in the area. What are the tools that these people use? Well, they use seductive semantics. You will see in these articles terms used such as self-aware and consciousness. They are, they are used without being defined. In my presentation, I'm going to try to define all of the words before we discuss them. They also use seductive optics. Many times you see a robot and this robot is talking and doing some things. And the fact that it's a human appearing robot gives you a sense of awe. Uh, actually, artificial intelligence often has nothing to do with its container. And many times the robot is simply a container for the artificial intelligence that enhances the presentation. That's an example of seductive optics. And also in some of these, uh, some of these articles are hidden details. And I want to go through those. These, these are very interesting. Here, here is one from the Daily Mail. This is a headline that says, no more secrets. New mind reading machine can translate your thoughts and display the text as text instantly. Notice that instantly is capitalized, uh, emphasizing the importance of instantly. Again, this is this aluminum foil hat that you want to buy to protect your thoughts from artificial intelligence. Well, you know, if you go dig and you look at the original article done by the researchers originally, you find out some interesting things that were not reported in the article. Number one, all of the thoughts were read from people who had flaps cut out of their skulls and they had sensors placed directly on the brain. Now, who would, who would ever volunteer for something like this? I, nobody. I wouldn't volunteer to get a flap cut out of my skull. So what they did is they went to a hospital that treated people with epilepsy. 
These people have seizures, and many times to treat the seizures, to localize the origin of the seizures, physicians, surgeons will cut a flap out of the skull, place an electromagnetic uh, grid on the brain, and attempt to look at the brain waves to isolate the source. So this was not this was not said. Yes, you can you can read text, but you know what? You have to have a flap cut out of your skull, and you have to have the electrodes placed directly on the brain. Another thing they didn't say is that it was only a few cards. Uh, people were shown cards in the training aspect of the neuro, of, of the artificial intelligence, and then eventually the brain waves were able to be recognized as being associated with individual cards. It was a card like an apple and a car and things of that sort. The other thing they didn't tell you is if you had a flap cut out of your brain and I had a flap cut out of my brain and I trained artificial intelligence and you trained artificial intelligence, your artificial intelligence, your machine intelligence would not work on me. It's not transferable. And my machine intelligence would not work on you. So here are some of the limitations. These are examples of, I think, uh, just omission on purpose for the purpose of getting clickbait. Here's another one which you might have heard about. Facebook shuts down chatbots that created secret language. Now, this is spooky because you have artificial intelligence learning, uh, learning uh, one uh, artificial intelligence talking to another artificial intelligence, and they create this special language so that you can't listen in and they're doing everything in secret. At least that was what was uh, portrayed in the article reported, as you notice in the upper left, by CBS News of all places. These are, these guys are supposed to be reputable, reputable sponsors, or rep, not reputable sponsors, but reputable sources of news. Yet in a couple of days, and not so widely reported, is a, is a rebuttal from the computer scientists that was on top of this so-called language creation. <clears throat> Uh, CNBC reported that Facebook AI researcher slams irresponsible reports about smart bot experiment. There was no creation of no secret language. This was something that happens when an AI experiment goes out of whack and the guy shut it down. And that's that. That's the end. That's the beginning and the end of the whole story. So again, this was hyperbole associated with a very simple operation in artificial intelligence research at Facebook. So the bottom line is beware of fake AI news. And when you read something that is gee whiz, if it sounds too good to be true, there's a chance that it is. And uh, beware of the seductive semantics. Seductive semantics using terms like consciousness and uh, self-aware without defining them is really vacuous. And also beware of deleted, um, deleted facts, as we have seen. Now, also to understand fake news, it really helps to understand the computer science limitations on artificial intelligence. And that's what we are going to address next. What are the AI limitations? Behind most AI limitations is, there's one word <clears throat> that, um, that kind of limits the use of artificial intelligence and computers in general. It's a word that John West used in his previous presentation, and that word is, Algorithms. Computers can only perform algorithms, a step-by-step -step procedure, or as it says here, a set of rules to be followed in a problem-solving operation. It's a recipe. All computer programs follow algorithms. You have to have an algorithm in your mind before you write a computer program. So an algorithm is a recipe. It is a procedure for doing something. Baking a cake is an algorithm. You have on the left the set of ingredients. That's the input to the algorithm. You have on the right the actual algorithm, how you use these inputs in order to bake yourself a delicious cake. You also have Google Maps, which tells you how to get from point A to point B. Giving directions is an example of an algorithm. It tells you how far to go, turn left, turn right, bear left, bear right, you're at your destination. So that's another other example of an algorithm. It's a step-by-step -step procedure for doing something. It turns out that all computer programs, anything to do with computer programs, is associated with an algorithm. Here is the website for my organization. I, I'm the director of the Walter Bradley Center for Natural and Artificial Intelligence. It's mindmatters.ai. If you're interested in this stuff and want to keep up on the latest developments and what is 
what is true and what is fake news. We have a number of excellent people that write articles for mindmatters.ai. But the point that I wanted to make here is here's a web page. Every time you see a web page, there's a so-called algorithm associated with it. If you look at this web page and you look at any web page, you right click and say view source, you know what you see? You see the computer program on the right that this web page is following. It tells where to put the pictures, where to put the text, uh, and everything else. So even web pages are constrained by algorithms. Everything in computers is an algorithm. Even the training of a neural network. Some of you have heard of artificial neural networks as being a special case of artificial intelligence, and it's a very, very powerful tool. But even the training of an artificial intelligence, even the training of an artificial neural network follows a recipe, it follows an algorithm. And this algorithm most commonly used is called error back propagation, and it is an algorithm. So even though we have machine intelligence, the training of it, this includes regular neural networks, and even some of the more uh, modern type of neural networks and deep learning, deep convolutional artificial neural networks all follow this algorithm of, um, of uh, error back propagation. Now, with this in mind, are there things which are non-algorithmic? We're so used to thinking of algorithms. You know, you get up in the morning and you plan your day. Yeah, that's an algorithm, right? Uh, you have your morning ritual. That, that's an algorithm. You look at your daily schedule. Well, that's an algorithm of how you use your time. What is non-algorithmic? Are there things which are non-algorithmic? The answer is yes. And there's kind of a couple of categories of it. One is definitively non-algorithmic. And the first one that I'm aware of was proved by the computer genius Alan Turing back in the 1930s. He is the father of modern computer science, another genius. And he showed that there was something called the Turing, what we call today the Turing halting oracle that is non-algorithmic. The Turing halting oracle would be able to examine any other computer program uh, no matter what the computer program was and decide whether that program would halt or whether it would run forever. If you've written a computer program, you know that some of your programs halt, hopefully they halt, or some of them get into kind of infinite loops and they run forever. Well, in general, it's impossible to write a computer program to analyze an arbitrary computer program to say whether it halts or runs forever. This is non-algorithmic, as proved mathematically, definitively, by, um, by Turing. And the halting problem is provably non-algorithmic. There are many other things in computer science which are non-algorithmic. In fact, the founder of algorithmic information theory, Gregory Chaitin, uh, posits that there are probably more non-algorithmic phenomena than there are um, algorithmic phenomena. How does this translate to us and what can we learn about algorithmic and non-algorithmic things in our own behavior and how artificial intelligence is eventually going to represent us? I see I'm coming up at 25 uh, minutes after the hour. I'll go a few minutes uh, over and then uh, that'll be it. Here are some non-computable human attributes. These are things which are characteristic in humans which cannot be replicated in a computer because they are non-algorithmic. If, if you are to do something in artificial intelligence, it has to follow an algorithm. These things are non-algorithmic. Uh, qualia, sentience, understanding, emotion, creativity, and consciousness. Here is a simple example. And I like this example because of its simplicity. You're looking at the left at something which is the color green. Now your job is to explain it to the blind man on the right who has been blind since birth you want to communicate him your experience. You can tell him the wavelength of the different colors of green. You can tell him that grass is green and as some apples are green. And you can give all sorts of explanations, but you will never be able to duplicate the exact experience you are having in seeing the color green. It is something which is non-algorithmic. And if you can't explain it to a man that's been blind since earth, but since birth, you're not going to be able to write a computer program to duplicate that qualia in another computer. It is, it is clearly non-algorithmic. Understanding is also something which is uh, non-algorithmic. This was best illustrated in 1980 by John Searle's Chinese Room. 
Uh, Searle was a philosopher and he said, imagine a room and he's going to sit in the room, not this lady on the right, but he's going to sit in the room and he's going to be surrounded by file cabinets full of Chinese uh, stuff. And people are going to slip notes through the door asking a question in Chinese. His job is to go through the file cabinets and to generate the, um, the answer to this question. So he looks through all the files and finally finds a match to the question. He copies down the solution, he writes down the solution, and he slips it under the door. Now, from the outside, it looks like who's ever in this Chinese room knows and understands Chinese. But does he? John Searle chose the Chinese room because he didn't speak Chinese. And he says, no, I could do this. I could do this translation in Chinese, even though I don't understand Chinese. If you'll notice, IBM's Watson uh, that competed in Jeopardy had access to an enormous Chinese room. It didn't understand what it was doing. Computers don't understand. They can add the number six and seven, but they don't understand what the number six is. They don't understand what the number seven is. And the last thing I'll probably talk about here is AI has no common sense. Now, this could possibly be algorithmic. It's something that is under study a lot. But there are a lot of people here, as you can see, that really have no common sense. Well, AI has no common sense. And the head of the Allen Institute recently called common sense the dark matter of artificial intelligence is something which, uh, which still remains unscathed. Here's an example. Fred Flintstone got his fingers glued into a bowling ball. He told Barney to go get a hammer because Fred couldn't get his fingers out of the bowling ball. Fred went and he got a hammer. And when Fred returned, I'm sorry, when Barney returned with the hammer, Fred said, okay, when I nod my head, hit it. Now you notice there's a big pronoun here and that's it. And we think it's funny simply because uh, that, um, we think it's funny because uh, we, we might be talking about hitting Fred's head as opposed to the bowling ball. We know what he meant, the other ones don't. They're actually, um, and I'll, I'll skip ahead here, they're actually yearly challenges made to artificial intelligence where they are presented uh, versions of this and they are unable to um, resolve the ambiguity. This was revealed in the great book, The AI Delusion by Gary Smith. He writes for us on Man Matters AI and they're still doing only about 50% accuracy and understanding, which is about the same as flipping a coin. AI cannot be creative, and we will have to skip over this. It's the Turing test, the Lovelace test, and uh, some other things. And thus far, AI has not been creative. So final slide. And you might ask these as questions. Can AI write music? You've heard, term, you've heard claims that it can. No, it can. It can only interpolate. If it's fed a bunch of works by Bach, it's going to generate something that sounds like Bach. Can AI generate art? You might have heard of the painting of the cost $50,000 that was auctioned at Sotheby's recently. No, it wasn't art. It was an interpolation of all of the things that was used to train the artificial intelligence. Can AI write screenplays? No, everything that AI has tried to write thus far in terms of uh, creativity has been just garbage. Is, um, is consciousness algorithmic? There is a coming consensus even among uh, people who are skeptical that indeed AI, I'm sorry, the consciousness is not algorithmic. Also, I'll dangle this. What do you think AI's biggest danger is? I will tell you that it's not the Terminator coming in and taking over with Skynet. It's something else. And if you ask me about it, I'll tell you what AI's biggest danger is. To finish, I do want to remind you about our website, mindmatters.ai where we talk about such things uh, like this. We try to bring down the dialogue in artificial intelligence to a sane level, a sane and educated level. And I would also invite you to get the free ebook, free copy of the ebook. If you don't want the ebook, you can buy a hard copy on amazon.com, but it's the case for killer robots. And it's at, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, mindmatters.ai uh, slash offer. So, Thomas, I buzzed through the last stuff, but I think I got through what I wanted to. And now you see why I revised my slides so much, right? I had a lot to go. Well, I mean, the, the good news is a lot of these questions. Uh, sorry, I'm hearing an echo. I'm going to turn down my volume. Um, 
The good news is a lot of these questions I think will be covered. You can be able to go back to your slides for them because it's some of the things that you skipped over. Um, so thanks, great presentation. I think it's a great topic. I'm always interested in these types of, you know, ethical questions when the, you know, when the situation we're in changes. Uh, we kind of have to re-examine ethics when there's new text. So I think that's fascinating. A uh, lot of questions about AGI, artificial general intelligence. Um, so I know that you sort of talked about how, you know, people are not totally algorithmic and robots are, but there's a hypothetical um, situation where a robot could be, could think in the way we think. And is that impossible? Is that something that will never happen? Or is it scientifically possible? And, you know, at some, at some point down the line, we'll be faced with that reality. Okay, uh, yeah, let me answer this. I was trying to get my slide up here, but... Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'll skip over that. Get rid of the slides, if you will, Thomas. I'll, I'll just do this regularly. You got it. Here's some examples of where uh, AI has failed. When Watson played in Jeopardy, there was an interesting case where there was a question answered. One of the humans answered it. And Alex Trebek, who was the quiz master, said, nope, 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 that's, uh, that's, nope, that's incorrect. Watson buzzed in and gave exactly the same answer. Now, uh, this was uh, kind of weird. Not a big deal, but it was, it was weird. It was a, what I referred to as an unexpected contingency. And this, in fact, is the biggest, uh, biggest problem of artificial intelligence today. Um, there are other things where Uber, not Uber, but uh, self-driving cars recognize windblown plastic bags and think they're deer if they're running, if they're stationary, sometimes they recognize as rocks. We're all familiar with the Uber driver killing, the Uber self-driving car killing that lady pedestrian a while back. And uh, there was a great story in 1983. These are more serious. And I'm gonna get to the answer. This dovetails into the answer in a second. There was a Russian AI system called OKU, and its job was to detect incoming thermonuclear missiles from the United States, because right then we lived in mutually assured destruction. And if the United States attra uh, attacked the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union only had a short window to return the attack. OKU was an automatic detection. All of a sudden in Moscow, their alarms went off that the Soviets were being attacked by US missiles. There was first one, then there was two, then there was four. Fortunately, there was a lieutenant general in command that said, this kind of seems fishy. He was advised by the AI at the time to launch a counter-strike. He said, you know, if I did this, millions of people are gonna die. This, by the way, is, is documented in the book, An Army of None by Paul Scherer. Really, really a great book. And, uh, he was right. It turned out that something happened uh, that screwed up Oko. It was actually mistaking reflections of the sun off of clouds as an incoming U.S. missile. Now, what do all of these things have in common? They have in common an unintended contingency, something that wasn't planned by the designers. And we are just doing a paper. We just submitted it on uh, unintended contingencies. It turns out that as the complexity of a system grows linearly, that the contingencies are going to increase exponentially. And if you get a complex system, you're going to have all sorts of um, unexpected contingencies. This is going to be the big, uh, the big battle that general AI is going to try to do, or going to try to uh, overcome is to battle all of these unintended contingencies so that self-driving cars, which are now being abandoned, by the way, if you, if you follow the news, self-driving cars, um, they, they're going to have to abandon this. They're not gonna have to abandon this. They're gonna have to address this problem if they're gonna get to a level five sort of um, operational status. And so if you get complex systems, you got you got unintended contingencies, and that is the biggest danger in artificial intelligence. Now, someday we might have a computer that's getting smarter and smarter and smarter, and someday we might be able to tackle this. No, Alan Turing had a thesis advisor named Alonzo Church. They both came up with a technique for computing. 
they found out that their techniques were basically um, basically identical. And this has been uh, come down to us as something called a, the Church Turing thesis, which says that all computers can do basically the same thing. Alan Turing's original machine in the 1930s can do what we do today with the supercomputers. Now, it might take millions and billions of times longer, but if there is a limitation associated with Turing's original machine, that same limitation can be imposed on computers today. So for that reason, we have the halting problem. It's not algorithmic. It couldn't be done by Turing's machine. It'll never be done by computers uh, as of today. So when thinking about uh, the future of artificial intelligence. We're going to have more memory, we're going to have more computer power, but our ability is still going to be limited to the algorithmic, and we have to watch out for that exponential explosion of contingencies, many of which are going to be uh, unexpected. Uh, just, just to quickly follow up, so it's not, um, it's not possible with computers, algorithmic computers as we have them now, but it's, is it scientifically impossible to with some other technology to create general intelligence and have computers that think like humans well you know a lot of people refer to so-called quantum computers quantum computers are supposed supposedly the next uh, edge of computation they'll be able to crack um, uh, encryption and do incredible wonderful things uh, there's it's been a slow it's been a slow journey to perfecting quantum computers for those that are trying to do it. Uh, but even quantum computers are limited by algorithmic uh, aspects. You are going to have to come up with a computer that can perform things which are non-algorithmic. Okay. Um, okay, so this one from Julie Miller. Uh, could you discuss the Lovelace test as a way to judge whether the machine only appears to have human level intelligence and consciousness and creativity? Sure. The, the Lovelace test was named after Ada Lovelace. She was the first computer program. She, she programmer. She um, programmed Babbage's computer in the, in the uh, 19th century. I don't think she ever did it because Babbage never built it, but she talked about it. And it was uh, created by Summer Bringsjord, a French alert polytechnic, who was very skeptical of Turing's test for uh, creativity. And here's the Lovelace test. A computer will be deemed uh, creative if it does something which is outside the explanation of its programmer. Now, you can have surprising tests. Um, there was, for example, in AlphaGo. AlphaGo made an incredible, exciting move. But my goodness, AlphaGo was trained to play Go. You ask it to do something simple like explain to you the game of Go, then mm -hmm. If it explained the game of Go without additional programming, that would be that would be creative. Or if you had a, if you had a a, um, a a software that played checkers and on its own without additional programming, it went on and said, you know, I think I'm going to play chess. That would be outside of the intent and the explanation of the original programmer. As of yet, in fact, I just did a podcast with Summer Bring George. You go to mindmatters.ai. Really, really fascinating genius guy. And he says that in his um, in his proposal of the Lovelace test, I believe it's about 15 years ago, that there has not come there. There's been no AI that has approached creativity as measured by the Lovelace test. Mm. Okay. Uh, so, what are your thoughts on AI as replacements for soldiers or drones as weapons of war? Um, I think. I, I think that AI is going to be AI is going to be a part of warfare, whether we like it or not. Uh, China has put thirty billion dollars into artificial intelligence and wants to be the world leader in artificial intelligence. And if you know China, they're going to do a lot of that. They're going to put a lot of that money into military applications. Vladimir Putin in Russia says that whoever controls AI is going to control the world. So you know that Russia is going to do that. And if history teaches us anything, and John talked about this, is learning about science and, and doctrine from history, is that technology wins wars. The World War II was won because of things like the Norden bomb site. It was won because of the cracking of the Enigma code. It was won because of the invention of radar. It was won because of the invention of the atomic bomb. Those technologies 
those technologies contributed to the winning of the war. And since then, they have given people pause. If your adversaries know that you're powerful and you have a lot of weapons, they're not going to pick a fight that they're going to lose. That's unfortunate. That's terrible. But that's the way of the world. And I think that the United States has no um, no other choice but to explore a Thomas artificial intelligence and uh, to use it in warfare. But it will never take over, for example, the commander in the field. And it will be a tool. As I mentioned on the outset, artificial intelligence is a tool like electricity, like fire, uh, like a bunch of other things that we use. And it's how to use this effectively as a um, as a as somebody that suggests things to the people in command. Yeah. Um, I think this is going to have to be your last question. Um, deep, this is from Paul Zickers. Deep fakes, facial recognition, pattern analysis, et cetera, are useful for social control. What are your concerns with AI and social control? I just did a podcast. And you should go to mindmatters.ai and listen to it. It's with the D. Simon, and it's about the Grasmov doctrine uh, of the Russians and their idea of using deep fakes and uh, cyber cyber sort of phenomena in order to do a new type of battle in the United States. So yes, it is going to be used. And yes, we do have to keep our eyes out for it. It used to be there were forensic people that could look at photographs and see if they were doctored. I frankly don't know whether that technology exists for some of these deep fake sort of things. If you want to get into a business and figure out how to do it, how to figure out what is deep fake and what isn't deep fake, uh, simply by looking at the images, that might be a good thing to do. But yes, it's something which is being used on us currently and will be used in the future. And that is the Gerasimov doctrine from, uh, he, he was a Russian general mm -hmm. reported that uh, that technology. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for your time. Really, it was a, a great presentation. Um, Dr. Brian Miller, if you're on, please enable your camera and uh, you know, thank you, thank you for uh, to Doctor. Uh, oh, can I can I mention one other thing? Uh, sure. I, I saw in the comments where do you get uh, copies of the slide? If you're to email me, and I'm going to give it to you just orally, r dot marks at i e e e e i triple e dot org. I will be glad to send you email you a copy of the slides. Okay. And everybody will receive a copy of the whole video of this conference after it's over. So oh, okay. uh, you'll all be recording. Um, okay. Uh, Bye-bye. So thank you. Hi, Brian. You know, Hi. <laughs> <laughs> the sad thing about that one, you guys had some very cool um, sounding uh, questions that I wasn't able to, to ask. So I'm sorry to leave those out. Uh, Dr. Miller, we introduce people with memes. This is your meme. Uh, Dr. Marks, you can disable your camera. Uh, okay, thank you. So this is what I came up with for you uh, that I, I think it will be good for your talk. I thought it was a hilarious picture, but also, um, you know, who said that, you know, meme culture wasn't, you know, thoughtful and introspective. Um, you know, God's, it says, you know, the two books together, God's not mad at, at you. Uh, and then the other one is he's just not that into you. Um, so <laughs> that's your, that's your uh, meme introduction, but uh, allow me to give you um, your actual introduction as well. So uh, Brian Miller holds a PhD in physics from Duke University. Uh, he speaks internationally on topics of intelligent design and the impact of worldviews on society. Uh, he's consulted on organizational development and strategic planning, and he is a technical consultant for The Startup, a virtual incubator dedicated to bringing innovation to the marketplace. Um, so I'll remove the meme. Uh, Dr. Mill, we have a, a video that we're going to play before um, before you you start, um, and I think it's this one. Um, I'll sort of disappear uh, in a second. Um, you know, once this is loaded, if you if you want to say anything to prep it, uh, I will allow you to do that. If not, just press play, and don't forget to turn off your microphone as the video is playing. Uh, and I'll see you in twenty five minutes for the Q and A. Great. This will be a nice introductory video about the evidence for design in nature. And then uh, after it, I'll talk about it in more depth and other types of evidence of design in nature. So enjoy the video. If you were designing a universe for life, 
I suspect you might design it differently. There is no evidence of design or purpose to our universe. I'm a speck, on a speck, orbiting a speck, among still other specks, in the middle of specklessness. I am not, I am incident, I suck. No design, no purpose. Are we really just insignificant specks in an accidental universe? Do we really just suck? Those are some dramatic claims, but not everyone thinks that way. In fact, some very distinguished scientists disagree. Freeman Dyson, a world-renowned physicist and mathematician, says, and I quote, The more I examine the universe and study the details of its architecture, the more evidence I find that the universe, in some sense, must have known that we were coming. So maybe it's not an accident that Earth is habitable. We caught up with physicist Bijan Namadi, who was a senior engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab for over 16 years. What we've discovered in the last few decades is that the properties of the universe in general and our planet in particular are fine-tuned not just for our survival but actually for our, our thriving our benefit so earth is not just habitable it's better than that it's hospitable it's like this imagine you're a space explorer and you land on a distant planet there's no water no oxygen and it's 300 degrees below zero you're screwed. But then off in the distance, you see a structure. And the closer you get, the more it looks like a house. When you open the door, you find it's been filled with warm, breathable air. You take off your spacesuit and find a faucet with drinkable water and a refrigerator stocked with healthy and delicious food. What's your first thought? The house and everything in it was the product of a mindless natural process? Or that it was designed to take care of you, to meet your needs? and that someone prepared it as a home for human beings, like you. Our planet, Earth, is that home. Our planet is a terrestrial planet. It has water and carbon, both necessary for life. It has an oxygen-nitrogen atmosphere in just the right proportion for life to thrive. We have plate tectonics to circulate minerals. We have a magnetosphere that protects us from harmful radiation. Our moon stabilizes our axial tilt, giving us a stable climate. And we have gas giant planets, particularly Jupiter, cleaning up the solar system from comets and asteroids that can harm us. And we are located in the habitable zone of a very stable energetic star, which itself is located in the habitable zone of a metal-rich mature galaxy. So the Earth is apparently exceedingly rare. There is no design or purpose to our universe. Still stuck on that? Even though the Earth meets exactly the conditions needed to sustain life? Well, what about our universe and the precise settings of its physical laws that keep things in order? What they call fine-tuning. Cosmological physicist Frank Tipler explains. Fine-tuning in physics refers to the fact, the observed fact, that were we to modify the constants of nature just slightly, life would never appear in this universe. Imagine you have a universe app where you can mess with the universal laws of physics from the beginning of time. Starting with gravity, too strong and the stars would be unstable and deadly to life. Too weak and the stars would struggle to create carbon and oxygen. Again, no life. We got Stephen Meyer, who holds a PhD from Cambridge, to break it down. The force of gravity is not too strong, not too weak, the speed of light, not too fast, not too slow. The ratios of these fundamental forces are delicately balanced. It's the just right universe that makes life possible. So it's got to be exact. But materialists say we just got lucky with gravity. Now, let's set our universe app to random and tap the button. What are the chances that the app will luck onto a gravity setting that just happens to allow life to emerge? Scientists have crunched the numbers, and the answer? Not good. You mean not good like one out of a hundred? I'd say one out of a million. 
Actually, for gravity, it's worse. Worse than one chance in a billion, times a trillion, times a trillion. So you're telling me there's a chance? Yeah! Yeah! We all love rooting for long shots, but here's the thing. It's not just gravity. There are many other physical laws that also have to be just so for life to emerge in the universe. And some of them are even more fine-tuned, even more unlikely than gravity. Without fine-tuning, our universe would be a horror story even Stephen King couldn't imagine. The very construction of the world and the fact that we seem to be the only blue populated planet in the universe, it makes you have to believe that if we happen by accident, it would make winning the lottery look like flipping a coin. So I have a tendency to believe in intelligent design. Nobel Prize winning physicist Charles Towns seemed to agree by stating, and I quote, intelligent design, as one sees it from a scientific point of view, seems to be quite real. This is a very special universe. It's remarkable that it came out just this way. But of course, materialist scientists claim they have a better answer. There's an ob obvious and e easy naturalistic explanation in the form of the cosmological multiverse. The multiverse acknowledges that the conditions necessary to make life in this universe are incredibly improbable. But it posits the existence of multiple billions of other universes, and we just happen to be in that lucky universe. Keep in mind that there's no evidence that these other universes actually exist. There are no experimentally tested laws of physics telling us that these other universes exist. No evidence for leprechauns, no evidence for unicorns, no evidence for the existence of other universes with different values of these fundamental constants. And there's still another problem with the multiverse explanation. The new mechanisms that have been proposed as possible ways of generating new universes themselves require fine-tuning. So in order to explain the fine-tuning, you have to posit prior universe-generating mechanisms that themselves require fine-tuning. And so, in the end, you're left right where you started. Right, right where, where you started. started. The many aspects of nature that have been fine-tuned for life are overwhelming. All of this evidence shows you are not insignificant. You are not an accident. And you don't suck. Someone had you in mind. Someone had us all in mind. We are not materialists. We see the human soul. We experience love. We live with purpose. We fight for justice. We are the quiet majority, and we will be quiet no longer. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why this is so important, because when I was in college as a freshman, um, I believed in a creator. I thought my life had purpose. But then I faced a lot of uh, opposition to that belief. In fact, one of the big challenges is from a, uh, a book, and I'm going to pull up my uh, presentation. And uh, that book was from a man named Richard Dawkins. And his most popular book that you may have heard of is called The God Delusion. But uh, there's an even older book called The Blind Watchmaker. And what, Darwin, uh, what uh, Dawkins argued is he said, when you look at life, you might think you see the evidence of design, but it's all an illusion, that it's all just simply chance and time and natural processes. And after I uh, read uh, Dawkins, after I had different challenges to my beliefs, I became pretty convinced that Probably there wasn't a creator, there wasn't a God, probably I'm just simply a product of the blind forces of nature. And that was reinforced by this narrative I heard uh, in my school. I went to MIT undergraduate, and it was sort of this narrative went that people of faith are people that just sort of accept things blindly. They're kind of emotional, they may believe in a creator or an afterlife, but that's just sort of a fairy tale. And that was in contrast to people of science who were objective, they were logical, and they looked at the facts. And I, I sort of fell into that perspective for a while, and it became very discouraging because I realized that if I was simply an accident of nature, if I wasn't created, but I was simply here through blind processes, then that means that life has no purpose. Because if I, it doesn't matter how I live, if I'm kind or cruel, happy or sad, I'll die, I'll cease to exist. Eventually our planet will cease to exist. It'll, it'll be destroyed when the sun blows up. 
and eventually all the free energy of the universe will run out and there'll be no more life. So that was very, very discouraging. And what I realized is I looked at other people that were from that perspective, like Lawrence Krauss, who is a physicist, who is an atheist that wrote the book, A Universe from Nothing. He gave this very uh, pithy quote. He said, we constitute a 1% bit of pollution in the universe. We are completely irrelevant. In other words, in this framework of what's been called scientism, life has no purpose, no value, no meaning. There's no such, such thing as objective morality. And then, of course, Lawrence Krauss has gotten into trouble for living consistently with his worldview in ways that made the public unhappy, but that's just sort of a natural, uh, a natural conclusion. And that put me on a quest where I, I asked myself, um, is that true? Is it the fact that I'm simply a product of the blind forces of nature, or was I created? Do I have a purpose? And that led me to study things from physics to chemistry to biology. And what I realized is the more you look at science, the more it points to a creator. In fact, a little bit of science might take you away from faith, but a lot of science will bring you back. That's, that's sort of a common uh, experience. In fact, uh, there's a very famous uh, quote from uh, someone I'm sure you've heard of, Albert Einstein. And he said the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. And, and that is really striking because if you assume that your brain come about, came about through evolution and blind processes, why would you expect that your brain would evolve to understand things like quantum mechanics or general relativity, or basically understand how the, the most intricate details of our universe operates? That makes no sense. It doesn't help for survival. It doesn't help you to, uh, to reproduce more, to eat better. But if we were created in the image of our creator, as, as traditional Christian theology teaches, as I'm a Christian, as well as other faiths, then it makes sense that our universe should be orderly, that a creator would create the universe in a certain logical framework. Also, if we're created by that creator, that creator would give us the ability to understand that order. And in, in the Christian tradition, there's the idea to go off, to multiply, and to understand, and to cultivate the world. So it's sort of a commission within that faith perspective to actually do science, to understand the world and make the world a better place. So really, science and faith are interconnected, and there's, it's not an accident that most of the great scientific leaders, people like Newton, Galileo, Kepler, these people that were the founders of science were Christian, and it was their faith that created a fertile soil in which they were able to do science, and that was really encouraging to me. But what happened is the more I studied science, the more I realized that science points to design. And the video did a beautiful job of showing how we see that design in, this, in the structure of our universe. In fact, if you were to look at our universe and imagine that it came about through a universe creating kit, like in a universe generator, and that universe generator was sort of like a mixer board at a concert where every knob and dial can control some detail of the universe. One knob would be the strength of gravity, another knob would be the mass of the proton, another knob could be the initial entropy of the universe. So many dials have to be perfectly set to allow for life in our universe that it cannot happen by chance. And the video talked a bit about, uh, about the force of gravity, that if gravity were slightly more or slightly less, we wouldn't be able to have um, a universe that could support life. And just to give you a sense of how precisely you have to set that dial, it'd be kind of like if you're a, marks, a marksman and you're trying to shoot a target, which is one inch by one inch, or one centimeter by one centimeter, and you have to hit it, and that target was at the other end of our solar system. The precision you would need to hit that target is the precision you would need to, to adjust that dial for gravity to have a universe that could support life. But there's countless other details. If you look at everything from the mass to the proton versus the mass of the electron, if you look at the force between uh, the uh, positive and negative charges and compare that to the gravitational force. If you look at things like the force of the, the mass of neutrons uh, and protons or quarks, you find there's countless of these little dials that have to be beautifully set to allow for life. And then as the video talked about, it's not just in the laws of nature, the, the physical constants, the, the nature of the physical forces, but it's in the details of our planet. Because even with a universe that can support life, there's no guarantee you're gonna get a planet that can support life as well as ours. And we talked in the video talked about just our atmosphere, 
how not only is our atmosphere uh, have oxygen in the right amount for us to breathe, but the atmosphere allows the right frequencies or wavelengths of lights through it because the atmosphere only allows light in the infrared and the uh, the visible light spectrum and uh, it, it, a little bit in the ultraviolet. And what happens though is it doesn't allow lower frequencies or higher frequencies to get through. And that's good because if microwaves could come through or if like um, X-rays, then that would be very, very bad for life. So our atmosphere and water also in the oceans only allow the right frequencies through for life. And that's an incredibly narrow band. Um, also, uh, we, they talked about the magnetic field around the Earth. If there wasn't that magnetic field, life would be impossible. And that's due to the fact that we've got a magma core, the magma in our uh, planet that rotates and creates this magnetic shield, which is quite extraordinary. There's no guarantee that that could happen. Um, if you look at our moon, uh, the, mo the video talked about the moon. And the, and the moon has just the right size and distance from our sun or from our Earth that it, that it allows our tilt to be just right. And if it wasn't there, our tilt would wobble and that would create massive windstorms that would basically make uh, civilization impossible on our planet. Uh, the moon also circulates the oceans so that oxygen can get to greater depths so that there can be sea life throughout the oceans. The sun is, is, very, is perfect for life. It's highly, highly stable. And again, it produces energy in the right frequency that we need uh, in infrared and, and light, in, in uh, visible predominantly. And it's very, very stable, which is important because if there was lots of solar flares, that would make civilization impossible. Um, also, if you look at our solar system, um, we're in the perfect place in our solar system or in our galaxy, because if we were too close to the center of our galaxy, we would be killed by the radiation uh, from, from like a supernova, things like that. And if we're too far at the edge, the planet wouldn't have the sort of metal that would be necessary for, for civilization. So we're, we're in the perfect place in our, in our galaxy for life. Um, but it's not just that everything is designed for life, but what you find is everything is also perfectly designed for scientific investigation, cultural advancement. It'd be a beautiful example, and this is like in the book, The Privileged Planet by Guillermo Gonzalez and Jay Richards. They talk about how our moon is the same size visibly to us as our sun. And we have uh, perfect solar eclipses where the moon co goes on top of the sun so that all you can see is a very narrow edge of the sun. And that's important because that what that allowed is for us to study the physics and chemistry of the surface of the sun. In addition, what it did is it allowed us to observe how light rays from stars, when they go past the sun, the gravity bends those light rays so the, sun, the stars appear a little bit off from where they normally would be. So that allowed us to understand general relativity. Um, also, if you look at things um, like the issue of the magnetic field, not only does the magnetic field help us to protect us from uh, radiation, it allows us to navigate the oceans with a compass. One of my favorite examples is fire, because if you want to have civilization, if you want to advance culturally, you need fire to melt metals to create tools. So fire is essentially essential for cultural advancement. And what happens is our oxygen in our atmosphere is perfect not just to breathe, because if we had too much oxygen, it would, uh, it would start to erode our cells. If we had too little, we wouldn't have enough energy. But it, it's, it's beautiful for fire because if we had too little oxygen, we couldn't produce fire. If we had too much, the, the fire would burn down all the forests. And what happens also is we've got nitrogen in our atmosphere, just the amount, that acts like a fire retardant. So it also prevents fire from going out of control. So again, this is a beautiful example of, of design for scientific investigation. And one of my favorite examples too, is the wavelength of light is perfect for the optics of the eye. Because if the wavelength of light were, were much, much longer, then the light would require eyes the size of a football field to focus properly so that we could have high resolution vi uh, vision. As it turns out, the, the wavelength is perfect for a focal point, which is just about the size of the eyes you see in organisms. And what happens is if you look at the photoreceptors in cells, you have to have a photoreceptor of a certain size to pick up the light because you have to have a certain number of the uh, molecules that, that will absorb the photons. And it turns out the maximum resolution for vision you can get from the size of the photoreceptors based on the chemistry matches very closely the resolution we get due to the optics. So you're seeing this convergence of details of physics, of biology, of chemistry that allow for both life and scientific investigation. Uh, so uh, 
that was very encouraging to me because what I saw is from physics, from chemistry, from astronomy, from studies of our planet, of our sun, of our moon, we're seeing this picture of purpose, of design, and even designed perfectly for humans because only humans advance technologically and culturally. So fire won't help chimpanzees very much. So uh, one field that I wanna talk about now is the field of biology because many people argue that if there's any field that doesn't speak to design, that speaks to the fact that we're just simply here by chance and time, it's biology. And what I want to talk about, first of all, is really answering this question is, does the evidence of design we see in life, is it real or is it an illusion? But before we talk about that, I want to talk about how do you detect design? Because before we can talk about if the appearance of design is real, we have to talk about how do you actually detect design? So what I'm going to do is do a little test for you. And what I want you to um, think about is how do you detect design in general? Like if you see something like a face on Mars or you see something on Easter Island or Stonehenge, how do you know if that's just produced by wind and erosion and earthquakes or is it produced by an intelligent agent? In fact, if you look at such, such images, um, you can only explain them in general by four different explanations. One is what you see is purely by chance. Like if you have a bowl of alphabet soup and uh, that, that alphabet soup happens to form the word Bob and your name is Bob, you're probably not going to think it was a message from God because Bob is such a, uh, is such a highly probable uh, arrangement of letters that it's simply explainable by chance. But if you uh, saw the first act of Macbeth, you know that wasn't by chance. Or you might see something that's explainable by physical laws. So if you look at something like, uh, you look like a, a crystal, like a, a cube that's made of salt, that design, that pattern is from the physical law of electromagnetism because the attraction between the sodium and the potassium or the sodium and the chlorine uh, creates this crystal structure. That pattern is explainable by a physical law. Another ex explanation could be chance and physical law. So if you look at, let's say, uh, a, a snowflake, the snowflake has six sides and that uh, hexagonal pattern is explainable due to the uh, physics of oxygen attracting hydrogen and water molecules. That's why you have this hexagonal pattern. But the details of every snowflake is different. So that's a good example of how chance and law can work together. And of course, the only other explanation for a pattern is intelligent agency, a designer. So what I'm gonna do for you is I'm gonna show you four patterns. And I want you to guess if that pattern is not designed, if it's produced by chance and physical processes. And when I say design, I don't mean design like the laws of physics. I mean design after the universe was created, a designer that came in and, and designed things. So if you, if you see a pattern and you know it's designed, I want you to make that number a 10. If you see a, a pattern that you know is not designed, I want you to make that pattern a one. So it's a scale from one to 10. If you're just completely uncertain, that'd be a five or a six. If you're pretty confident, the pattern I show you is designed, but not completely confident, that would be like a seven, eight or nine. And if you're pretty sure it's not designed, but you're not entirely uh, sure, you wouldn't bet your life on it, that'd be like a two, three and four. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put up this poll. And uh, as I show you these different images, I want you to decide what number is this in terms of your confidence that it's designed? One, not designed. 10, it's designed. Uh, so here is the first image. This is an image on, Mar uh, on Mars. So from uh, this poll, I want you to ask yourself, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, start poll, there we go. So on this poll, I want you to decide, is it not designed? That's a one. Is it designed? It's a 10. So start uh, taking the poll, go ahead. Okay, so we got a few two, threes, and fours. Uh, several that think it's definitely not designed. One person that's absolutely convinced it's designed, they bet their life on it. Um, we're seeing more and more ones. So we've got like 27, 28 ones. Uh, we were seeing a few twos, threes, and fours, and then a couple people that are convinced it's designed. Okay, very good job, very good, good job. I'm gonna close the poll. So uh, most people said it's not designed, and that would be the correct answer. In fact, I told you it was a face on Mars, so that's a good hint that it's not designed. 
Uh, in, in fact, if you look at this image with much higher resolution, what you find is the appearance of a face is purely an artifact of low resolution and shadows. If you were to look at it more with high resolution, it's clearly not designed. And you also notice that you have crater marks around it, which are very similar to the uh, like the eye, the so-called eye in the image. So this is something produced by natural processes and chance. Okay, good job. Here's a second image. And um, I'm gonna go to our, our next poll. Okay, so I'm gonna start the poll and uh, from one to 10, decide if, for yourself if this image is designed or is it not designed. Okay, one it's not designed, two not designed, three not designed. Okay, we've got one person, uh, uh, three persons that definitely think it's designed. Um, we've got some that are not certain, but they're pretty sure it's not designed. That's the, that's the majority so far. Lots and lots of ones, lots of ones. Few people, totally not certain. Now, for those um, four of you that were certain that it was designed, you would be correct. Because if you look very, very carefully, you can actually see the Photoshop lines. So this is actually an image of a horse made from clouds that was produced by Photoshop. So this is actually an example of something that was designed. So good job, you uh, six people that were sure that it was designed. Okay, here's the next image. So what I want you to do is figure out, is it designed or not designed? So we're going to start the poll. Okay, we have one person that's really convinced it's designed, one person that's not sure, but they're pretty convinced. Lots and lots of people are pretty convinced it's designed. One person said it's definitely not designed. Four people said, I'm pretty sure it's not designed. Um, but we're getting lots of people, 28 people that are convinced it's designed, 17 that are pretty sure it's designed, five not sure, six that are pretty sure it's not designed, but not quite sure, three that are pretty sure that it's not designed. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll. Uh, those three of you, those that 4% is correct. It is not designed. It is produced by uh, the natural chemical processes of this geode. It just sort of, it just so happens that the minerals create what looks like a cross. Now, how could, how did those three people know it wasn't designed? Well, I would suspect they would notice it's inside of a rock and it's kind of hard to create these nice geometric patterns inside rocks. Also, you'll notice that there's irregularities. There's sort of irregularities on the bottom. It's not a perfect cross. There's other um, splotches that look very similar. So this is something that's not designed. It's produced by uh, the natural processes. And some of you could figure that, that out because of its geometric structure. Geometric structures, uh, uh, natural processes is really, really good at creating that. Okay, I'm gonna do one more picture. So take your time, this will be a little tricky. So uh, this is an image and I want you to ask, is it designed or is it not designed? Okay, so here's the image. And uh, let me uh, go to the poll and we'll start our polling. Okay, we have someone who's very confident, lots of confident people is designed. Okay, it's just going up with the tens. Good for you, good for you. I'm gonna close the poll. Now, the question you've got to ask yourself, um, one person was not convinced it was designed. They're pretty sure it's produced by, by uh, wind and erosion. That's cool. It, it actually is designed. This is Mount Rushmore. Um, and the question becomes, how do you know that if you look at these faces, that Mount Rushmore is very, very different from the face on Mars? How do you know? What are the differences? Or how is it different from that geode? Um, and if you look at it, and you were able to basically cross out the possibilities of chance and physical law and you got design. Well, here's how you knew that. The, um, the image of Mount Rushmore, as opposed to the other uh, images, contain what's called specified complexity. Uh, what that means is that it's a uh, highly complex. It's a very improbable pattern. You, you'd never expect it to be produced by chance. Uh, in fact, if you look at it, it's not definitely not a process of natural processes. 
because um, the faces are very smooth, they're very regular, which is very different from the rest of the rock faces. But also it's specified because it matches a pattern that we can recognize. Because every pattern on every rock face is highly improbable. In fact, they're all essentially unique. But only a fantastically small percentage of patterns are gonna match the faces of presidents. So whenever you have a pattern that's highly improbable, it's not produced by a natural process, but it matches a pattern you recognize, or it has purpose and meaning, it has semantics. Um, it, however you wanna say it, you know it's specified, you know it's designed. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you an animation of a molecular machine in a cell, and what I want you to do is tell me, is it designed or is it simply a product of natural processes? So I'm gonna quickly go to the video and show you this. It's been called one of the wonders of the molecular world, an amazing nanoscale machine. ATP synthase is a high-tech micromolecular power generator inside the cells of your body. It generates adenosine triphosphate or ATP, an energy molecule that provides fuel that every one of your cells needs to function. Without this fuel, your cells will cease operation, and so will you. ATP synthase works like a rotary engine. The barrel-shaped rotator is composed of 10 to 15 protein parts called subunits. The rotator spins around, transmitting mechanical energy into the drive shaft of the machine, which helps make ATP. This drive shaft has a specially placed bump that opens and closes parts as the drive shaft spins around. This bump opens special protein subunits on the bottom of the machine. When the bottom subunits open, a spent energy molecule called adenosine diphosphate, or ADP, enters the machine. The mechanical motion causes the ADP to bind with an additional phosphate group, creating the ATP energy molecule. And the ATP drifts off into the cell, ready to power some biomechanical reaction. The ATP synthase machine has many parts we recognize from human-designed technology. A rotor, a stator, a drive shaft, and other basic components of a rotary engine. The ATP synthase is one of thousands of elegantly designed molecular machines inside your cells that make your life and all known life possible. Okay, so if I were to ask you, um, was that designed? or was that simply a product of the blind forces of nature, you would obviously know that it was designed. Uh, there'd be no doubt about that. And why is that? Well, the reason is because that motor shows highly improbable arrangements of molecules. Uh, incre incre incredibly improbable, because even one component of that machine represents a sequence of amino acids that form what's called a protein, in the same way letters form a sentence, you've got 20 amino acids that form a very specific sequence that form a protein, which causes the fold in a certain way. And the chance of a random set of amino acids forming a functional protein is like trying to pick a single atom out of a million galaxies. Not to mention, you've got a perfect arrangement of multiple proteins. It's, it's um, engineered and it has a purpose and it also matches what we know in human engineering, which is a rotary motor. So by all reasonable criteria, we see evidence of design. Thank you. Um, are we ready to go or do I have another minute or? Well, let me just add one more thing. Uh, what happens is one additional picture of design is when you look at the origin of life. Because in the origin of life, you must have information because I've already talked about how all of the building, most of the building blocks of life are formed of proteins and how those proteins represent amino acids, which are like letters in a very specific arrangement. So that essentially represents information in the arrangement of the letters of the protein that allow it to fold into the right shape to perform the right function. 
Also at the origin of life, what you have is proteins degrade very quickly. So you've got to have DNA, which encodes or stores that sequence of letters and proteins. It's, it's like the instruction manual for the cell. And a minimal cell, the simplest cell that could exist is like a, mil, a, a, megab a, a million bytes of information, a million bits of information. And that's important because information always points to a designer. Like if you were to get a pocket text and that pocket text was a bunch of random letters, you would think someone probably sat, sat on their phone and it was an accident. But if you got a pocket text or a, a text that said, don't tell anyone, but I cheated on the text, you would know that was designed because it contains it, functional information. Uh, in the same way, if you were to uh, go down and for lunch and you notice that your bowl of alphabet soup had a message that said, you will have success in business, you would know you could not explain that by the chemistry of the pasta or the physics of boiling water. The only way to explain large amounts of information is with a mind that points to design. So when you look at both the evidence from the laws of physics, you look at the details of our planet, you look at the details of life, you see undeniable evidence that we are designed for a purpose and we're not simply an accident of nature. Thank you. So I think we're uh, gonna have questions and answer now. Well, until, um, until it comes up, what I'll do, just do is I'm going to read some of your questions and, and answer them. Uh, oh, yeah. So one question is, is ATP synthase irreducibly complex like the bacterial flagellum? Uh, yes. In fact, let me define irreducible complexity. Um, the, the idea is that when you look at molecular machines or many aspects of life, actually every aspect of life at every level, you have multiple parts which all have to be there to function. So like the flagella is this molecular motor, which has like 50 different proteins. If you remove one of those proteins, the machine does not work, it's useless. That's called irreducible complexity. And the idea of the ATP synthase is exactly the same thing. You've gotta have the mechanism where the, um, the protons go through the channel, which create the force of the drive. You've gotta have a drive shaft. You've gotta have the catalytic site that rotates, it creates the ATP. So there, it's irreducible complex. And what people have argued before is that what's called co-option could explain irreducible complexity. And that's the idea that you've got other proteins and other machines, like a type three secretion system for the flagellum, and you could borrow all these different proteins and then you could create a new, a new machine. That's called the idea of co-option. The problem with that is that the proteins in these other machines are actually so different that you can't borrow them, they don't work but you also need an assembly process to put the pieces together and assembly tools to make it all work. Like if you buy a piece of Ikea furniture, you can't put all the furniture together without the instructions or your Allen wrench. The same thing is true with your molecular machines. You've got to have the proteins, you've got to have the assembly instructions, and you've got to have extra proteins that act like assembly tools. So irreducible complexity is not something evolution can explain, and it clearly points to design because you see specified complexity. Okay. Sorry, by the way, for – I don't know why it keeps kicking me out, but you can see and hear me now, correct? Yeah, of course. You're great. Okay. Well, thanks. It was a great presentation. Um, you did the you did the AP, ATP question, right, while I was – Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Okay. Uh, this one is, comes from former – uh, ISI Honor Scholar, Jenny, are dreams intelligently designed? Dreams? Wow. Um, wow. Uh, I would say yes and no. Because uh, dreams, there's a lot of research on dreams, and it's kind of mysterious how they work. But they probably are sort of a way your brain dumps needless information. So in one sense, they're not designed because you're sort of putting together random things Maybe it's your, your indigestion from your burrito. Maybe it's something that someone said. So in that sense, dreams may not be designed. But on the other hand, they are designed because they're a necessary part of cleansing the brain of needless information. At least that's one theory. So they do, they do show evidence of purpose and design in general, but I wouldn't take too much stock in your dreams as telling you your future. Okay, so um, this is from William Peters. Could life on Earth have 
been developed to suit the environment on Earth, meaning, you know, things, you know, in evolutionary theory, were, you know, things were less complicated before. Um, right. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I actually just did a paper. I mean, I did a, a, an article in the journal Inference, and I was able to uh, interact with Jeremy England, who's one of the world experts on this issue of origin of life and thermodynamics. And what I actually showed is that the origin of life, the, the idea of taking simple chemicals and forming them into this, this very high energy um, ball of chemicals, uh, a very low entropy or very high order is a physical impossibility because all natural processes, either near equilibrium or far from equilibrium, will tend to go to either lower energy, water runs downhill, high energy molecules break apart into low energy molecules, or it tends to go from uh, low entropy to high entropy. Things that are very ordered and very uh, systematic will break apart and become very disordered. Um, there's nothing in the universe that ever will simultaneously go to high energy and high order, yet that's exactly what had to happen with the origin of life. So the origin of the life is a physical impossibility according to physics. And I just engage with one of the world experts on that in the journal Inference. So you can look up Brian Miller Inference and you can enjoy it. Also, Evolution News, I talk about that. In addition, what you have to have with life is information. Um, to get a self-replicating molecular uh, machine like a cell is requires uh, hundreds of highly specific and coordinated chemical reactions and other processes. There is no chance that could happen by chance. Uh, in fact, in the cell, if you look at the mineral components based on studies of self-replication and minimal genome studies, a cell must have information processing, energy production, a global error correction. Uh, it's got to have control gates, let stuff in and stuff out. And if anyone sees a nanotechnology device with all that criteria, they would know they're dealing with the product of an intelligent designer. So the origin of life is a physical impossibility, and it shows undeniable evidence of design. Okay. Uh, so on our first first lecture, I don't know if you caught it with John West, we saw an uh, infograph where 80-something percent of us believe in God and 30-something right. percent of scientists believe in God. So right. uh, Chase Blosser asks, how is it that science can lead some scientists to believe in intelligent design and some to, to believe in chance? Great question. Really good question. Uh, what happens is throughout history, we're talking like the ancient Greeks, people looked at the world and saw design. It was obvious. If you look at the eye, you look at the wing of a bird, purpose, intentionality. Whenever people, for philosophical reasons, did not want to believe in a designer, it could have been like the Epicureans, in the, in, in, like Lucretius or Epicurus or people like that, what they did is they argued that chance and time can mimic the appearance of design. So that's what the Greeks did. In fact, when the Apostle Paul, in, in the book uh, he wrote to the Romans, talks about how people suppress the truth, uh, when they see the evidence of God's uh, shaping of the universe, his power, his majesty, and they su people suppress it, he was engaging the Epicureans that actually had an idea of evolution where chance and time could, could explain the appearance of design in life. Charles Darwin comes on the scene, and he, what, tar Charles Darwin was a materialist. He was a scientist. He, he believed in scientism, and he would tell people publicly, he used language with God language, but privately he rejected the idea of a creator, he would read William Paley, who had the famous watch argument, who argued that if you see a watch, you see evidence of design. And what Darwin did is he used his language, his illustrations, his rhetoric, but he replaced God with natural selection. So what he did was Darwin imparted to natural selection limitless creative power. So it was a way to replace God. So up until today, scientists will say, we see what looks like design, but we believe chance and time can explain away that, 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 that appearance. Although what's interesting is I, I attended the Royal Society of London meeting on new trends in evolutionary biology and top, top level uh, evolutionary theorists have said that we were not right. Natural selection does not have great creative power. And what they're trying to do is they came up with called an extended synthesis. Um, you have like the third wave and they were trying to find a new mechanism that could replace natural selection. And they had ideas like niche construction, phenotypic plasticity, ontogenetic information, et cetera, et cetera. Not one talk gave one piece of evidence 
that even remotely suggested that any mechanism, natural selection or otherwise, could explain the great ingenuity seen in life. So evolutionary theory is in the same place astronomy would be if astronomers found out that gravity stopped working after about 20,000 miles. So now it's really impossible to intellectually, to be intellectually honest and look at the evidence for design in life and simply ignore it. Okay, last question. Uh, you have one minute to answer and it's unanswerable. Um, it's from Vander. He wants to know, you know, if, if this world was designed, um, you know, why, why is the, why, and the designer is perfect. Why is his creation imperfect? You know, why is there something? Well, fantastic question. And that again is, is why I'm a Christian because the evidence of design points to a transcendent creator outside of time and space. It points to an imminent creator that is involved in the creation of DNA. But then you have to ask, why is the world such a mess? And in, in our theology, there's the idea that we were created in God's image, but we had a choice to either follow God or to rebel against him. And when people chose to rebel against God, what happened is that broke our relationship with our creator. It broke our relationship with creation and with each other, which brought evil suffering. And we were then uh, susceptible to things like earthquakes and plagues and viruses when before we were in a proper relationship with our creator, we were not. So that points to the idea of God. Okay. All right. So we end on a proof of God. So that seems that seems like a fitting ending. So uh, thank you, Dr. Miller. It was a great talk. Um, thank you, everyone that's still online. Um, it seems like it's most of you, which is very impressive. Um, I had a great time. Uh, I thought this this whole conference was fantastic. Um, if you learned anything from all three of these talks, I hope you learned it. A healthy amount of skepticism is a good thing. Um, well, can I quickly mention one more thing? Um, in the yeah. handout, I have a very, very detailed handout that deals with design in life and also a handout that is a special offer that John West talked about to get my chapter in the book, Unlocking the Mystery of Life. So please, please remember to download the handouts. Right. Download the handouts, handout column next to the chat. Um, and for those of you that liked this, uh, you know, and or have liked other ISI or Discovery Institute conferences in the past, I, can, I encourage you to stay plugged in with both organizations. Uh, I know the next conference that we have is on uh, the 26th with Jay Richards and the winners of our um, of our video social media video contest will be on with him talking about conservatism. We've got some really good video winners for that, uh, and more coming soon. Um, so stay tuned. We're going to keep running these. We love having you all here. I'm having a ton of fun. Uh, and thank you all for coming. In.